Welcome to the Theory of DFS podcast. I'm Jordan Cooper, aka Blender HD on Twitter, the co-author of the Theory of Daily Fantasy Sports. It's a 15-hour audio DFS masterclass that you can pick up at theoryofdfs.com. On with me this week, the the yin to my yang uh, at times. I think 95% of the time we agree with each other, but the 5% we I think I think we like joking back and forth. It's uh it's it's Brian Hooper. We got a we're getting two Hoopers in a row. Uh next week that there'll be there'll be another Hooper. You're not related to Alex Hooper, but it's uh Brick most people know you as Brick 75. Uh most people know you as uh one half of LOLs and also the person that's responsible for making Pete Overzet a profitable DFS player. <laughs> I'm not taking full credit. Pete, Pete, Pete knows more about football than I do. So, um, but yeah, Brick Seventy Five is is uh, in the gambling world is is well what well, well more known than Brian Hooper. But you talk about uh, Pete knowing more about football than you do. Like, like it's one of the things that you know, that I talk about a lot is about game theory. That do you do you need to know the sport? I mean, I remember a stream. I watch lols all the time. I used to watch live more often, especially during COVID when there's, there was nothing going on. Uh, I remember you had one stream where you were showing your Sims and your lineups for NFL. And, like, you had Naheem Hines in, like, some of your, like, top projected lineups. And at that point, it wasn't like the Naheem Hines when, like, uh, when Taylor was out and Wilkins was it was it wasn't one of those like oh Hines is the value play type of weeks. It's like no, it's the pass catching running back for you know a, a twenty eight point plus total team or whatever. And it just so happened that in your constructions that you know Hines shows up a bunch as the you know the four K running back. And I remember on the stream that people were like, "Ugh, what you're gonna play? You're gonna play a one percent owned Hines in a bunch of these like cheap stacks?" and the response that you gave was more like, like, I don't even know who Nahi Hines is. It's just like, like based on, based on my model and based on the projections, this is, this is what it is. And if I end up with 12% Naeem Hines, then if the math says it's that way, then that's the way it's going to be. I mean, isn't it, I mean, isn't that the core of the difference between someone like Pete or at least what Pete was and how you and, and, frankly, a lot of top DFS players play. I mean, probably. Yeah. I don't know what everyone else does. Right. You obviously don't don't because we had that episode where you didn't realize that everyone was aggregating projections. (laughs) That's what I was just going to say. Exactly. Yeah. I had no, no idea. Although I know, I mean, obviously Alex Baker is, and I know the Brito brothers, the pop gates, uh, they're doing stuff. Um, and some other guys are too, but yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was overestimating for sure. Um, you do, I mean, you do within reason, right? We need to know the players, especially for modeling, because when I tried to model soccer a couple of years ago, man, there are so many different name, var- name variations like Chicharito, Juan Javier Hernandez, Javier with an N-Y, you know, uh, Javier with an N-Y, Hernandez with two N-Y's and you got to match them all up and make sure you're grabbing the data from all the right sources. And, and if you don't know anything, right, it's, it's pretty tough to pull off a model and let's say there's a late back to the NBA or something. There's a late swap and you don't really know the players and you got, you know, 45 seconds like, Oh, that's going to hurt you. It's much better to know. Okay. If, if Damian Lillard's, Lillard's ruled out, I know CJ McCollum's probably a good play quick pump him up five points, quick re recrunch and get him in there. You know what I mean? It could be the difference between, but be, between those things. So knowing players, I think helps. I'm more on, I'm more, uh, I don't know amiable to that like line of uh reasoning is like yeah sure yeah you do need to know them within reason but i don't think knowing every cornerback and their height and weight and you know when they were drafted and what college and high school they went to matters and then stuff like that but even when it comes down to the individual lineups like in that example with naheem hines is that yeah like like what what i see a lot when it comes to projections and even like you you, you know me like i don't make my own i'm one of those I'm one of those aggregators. Mm-hmm. I'm one of those, you know, I I know what my strength is. My strength is more in exploiting what other people are doing. So it's like, I need to know what everyone else is doing, what they're looking at. And I'm like, as long as I have 
a projection set that is directionally accurate enough that like I can make, how do I exploit the field the best? Like we, we see with that, that a lot of times, especially at Roto Grinders where people sign up or people, you know, they come from that. I know the sport, but I don't know much about math. And they're like, well, how do I trust the projections? And a lot of, a lot of the, the cognitive dissonance there is it's that confirmation bias of, I think this guy is a good play today. And they check the projections of wherever they awesome. Oh, Roto grinders, wherever. And they go, Oh, he does project. Well, Oh, that, 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 that now confirms my bias, but then they'll see another guy that they think sucks. And he projects well also and go, well, I don't trust that projection. It's like, well, if you trust one project, if you, how do you, you can't, tr- you either has to have to trust the model or you don't trust the model at all. So with the instance with that Naheem Hines example is that in the scope of that full lineup, once you take into account the projection, once you take into account the ownership, if that's what makes sense, like it has to make sense. It can't just be like, well, the model is good except for this, except for Naheem, I have to X him out because <laughs> like he shouldn't be projected for 12 points because he sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I know who Naheem Hines is. I know you were kind of joking there, but like I was more or less saying like, you know, sometimes you get these guys who you don't know who, who they are or whatever, you know, they're not name brand guys. And, um, you just like is pretty much exactly what you said. If you trust exactly what you're doing, then you have to roll with it. Like you have to roll with it within reason, unless you have, uh, you know, you could lead you to go back and look at your model and be like, Okay, where did I screw up? You know, which happens quite a bit, and and then like, okay, I didn't make any mistakes. The sim ran this out. It likes it. It's pro. It was probably that week. It was probably more. It liked um, the chief stack, and Nahi Hines just fit with salary and some sort of upside. You know, could catch one for you know for thirty for a t- touchdown or something, and so like it just kind of all worked itself out. And you don't really know. That this is another reason why the difference between players people who like know the players and people who use game theory is I don't think you could hold all that stuff in your head. So like when you're running a sim or you're an expert at using a cruncher or something like that, like they do a lot of the legwork for you that you're going to forget that you can't calculate in your head. In my opinion, like I think it's, there's just so many variables and, and honestly you probably screw them up more than you help them um, by putting your expertise on it. Or you just weight them too much or too little, right? Yeah, th- this is what I'm saying about leverage, right? Like, and I know you love you love the term leverage. Yeah, it's I know. Not- I, I I agree, and I agree with your assessment that leverage we use in a very broad sense that really right. is not technically. It, it's one of those things, like it's same thing that where I use median when it could be mean, but in a large sample size, median and mean tend to be very close to one another. So instead of to confuse people, you use just, you just, you, when you say the word leverage, it's just like, it's the relative value of points of the lower the own, the players and the lower the own, the lineup, but leverage in and of itself is not really that. Right. It's much more, it's much more narrow than that technical term. That's the way I do it. And, and, and it's like that four for four article that came out years ago that people often reference. You can, you guys can Google it if you haven't read it. Um, I think that kind of led to some of this leverage. There's some math behind theirs. They're, you know, they're, they were trying and stuff like that, but most people, they just, from what I've seen and I watch, you know, occasionally I'll watch someone's video. They'll just like, I have more than the field. Therefore I have leverage. And it's like, right, that's well, not that, well that I don't agree with that. <laughs> like I'm, you, I'm on. Yeah. If you think about leverage, like if you're wrestling or something like that, like let you like, you're on top of an MMA, they're on top of the guy, right? Ground and pound, smashing the guy's face in. That's leverage. You're just making something up, right? Like, let's say you have the wrong guy and you're like, I got more than the field. It's like, oh, sorry. Uh, actually, he's not even playing today. You have no leverage. You have the, you have the opposite of leverage. You're giving money away. And so, and, and so leverage is, you know, you have to have ownership into play there. Or there could be like specific examples where like a guy, um, they're like anti-correlated where like if this guy get fouls out in the NBA or if fi- get fouls out early, his backup will get extra minutes or something, you know, something like that. Those are leverage spots. Just right, that's the technical... arbitrarily running your right. cruncher saying I have leverage is not. Well, the, the, not the, the point that I make is that like 
Leverage is when you when you're playing something negatively correlated to something else. So while like if the for instance in the slate yesterday for baseball and I discussed it on the pregame show that Dylan Bundy was the highest owned pitcher and it's like I'm going to play Texas Rangers as leverage because he's the Rangers stacks are negatively correlated with the highest owned high variance pitcher and. If that works out, I gain so much more relative value. And then leverage when it comes to, well, if Dylan Bundy's 48% owned and uh, I have him in 80% of my lineups, like that's leverage. And like my line, my, my attitude is, is that, well, what happens if your 80% of lineups suck? Like, like just, just because you have more of them doesn't mean anything. If the individual lineups that you're playing in, oh, I have 80% Dylan Bundy in the chalk angels, Stat, like in, in with lineups that are like communally owned by a million percent, it's like, well, I have more of him than so. Well, great, you have, you've now made, uh, you've now made 120 cash lineups. Way to go. Good luck. Good luck trying to get first place in it. So is is that kind of like what you mean by like the the expo like your exposure in and of itself into lineups? Because we see even even with you guys, with you, you'll play 150, and sometimes you'll bink with a lineup that there's a what the player that has 36 points in it like it's literally like the only lineup that these like like it just so happens that that guy fit in and then do you get do you get the quite I know you 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 don't you you do YouTube shows but you're like you're not a tout or anything but do you get like tweets from people like when you win in that way and it's like like what put you on that guy and like cuz a lot of cuz a lot of times, like I, I always say that, like I had Garrett Temple in a uh, NBA winning lineup, and people ask me, like, why'd you play Garrett Temple? I go, well, I needed a thirty-seven hundred dollar small forward, and he just fit, and like the projections just had him fit there, and and people just go, like, they throw up their hands and go, how the fuck do you play DFS this way? Like this, like it, it makes it sound like it's luck when 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 you have two percent of a guy, and it's yeah. like you couldn't have you couldn't have said in your head. Dude, I'm gonna play Justin Williams today, and I'm gonna put him in. Like it's just, it's the model, and it worked out. And like, how do you justify that to people that view that not as math and and just like, well, these these good players are just getting lucky. Yeah, I, I well, I I don't have to justify myself to anybody. Well, of course so you I don't. But answer, I'm just saying, but... but people will. If you're trying to teach people, like people will ask me, like, look. Yeah. Look, so and so put that guy like so. What do you? Why should I listen to anyone? Because this is all just random shit. Yeah, if they're nice, then yes. But you know, surprisingly, they, I've only gotten that I don't know five, ten times. I guess you know, I've only been I haven't been on Twitter that long. Like actually active on Twitter, so maybe it'll maybe there's more coming. But I have gotten it. I haven't gotten it that frequently. But it, a little maybe circle back here to leverage. Here's another reason why it's not good to think of leverage as just higher than the field because your your 150th lineup or whatever you might have a one get one percent of a guy who's owned at 12 percent but that might just be the 150th best lineup you don't know you know i often use like if the dfs gods example so like if the dfs gods gave you perfect projections like these are the best projections man can make right you would run it as 150 and take those 150 and shove them into every line, everything, right? And if the 150 lineup had LeBron once and he's 20% owned that day, you don't question the DFS gods. You stick them in there, right? So it's like it is possible that you can have uh, uh, under the field on guys. And th- this happens all the time in the, M- uh, in the MMA, right? Like mm-hmm. you – because you don't want to dupe and there's, there's a whole bunch of other reasons where you might uh, – but, but like – people might overdo that and they might put in bad lineups to try to avoid duping when they could have put in a pretty close lineup with the one chalky guy and just the combination uh, would work out to like low enough dupes and you have a much better shot of winning, but you would be under the field on that guy. And like people are scared when, Oh, he's 45% owned and you only have 12% of them. Just X amount, X amount, man. Why do you even have him in there? You know, like it's not, it's not just cut and dry. Look for over the field. Or under the field, or under because the like field. you said, that example of if you're oh some some especially like an NBA with like chalky guys, and it's like well you know this guy's going to be forty eight percent owned, and like what's the point of having ten percent of him? Just x him out. It's like well what happens if 
he fits in those lines. Like that's yeah. that's the best person for that that the highest projected guy for that lineup. You're because you're already playing like five percent on guys in the rest of your lineup. But to me, aren't those exposure like when like isn't it easier to to describe your strategy through exposures? Even though that's not really your strategy, like your exposures are really diversification of your set of line. Like, oh, you know, oh, this guy's chalky, but I only have fifteen percent of him, and because you believe that he's overowned, like, and that's the reason why you're only getting fifteen percent of him, because based on your quote leverage calculation, you're like, well, in order to get that properly owned lineup, I can't use a lot of him. He projects a little bit lower than maybe the rest of the industry, but at at the end of the day. Uh, the guy that's that's like the guy that's fifteen percent owned in that's in that spot is like you're not you you would say to someone I only have fifteen percent of them and that's the way that you describe that based on your model he's over owned and over projected but he's not so much over owned and so much over projected that he will not even make a hundred and fifty of your lineups. It just he makes less of your lineups, but to a normal lay person, that comes across as, oh, you don't like the guy, like you 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 don't think he's gonna do well, versus and then and then the second thing is, well, if you don't think he's gonna do well, why are you putting him in any of your lineups, right? Do you right. see where that slippery slope goes? Like the that that thinking I I call linear thinking of like, well, you're having him in less than the field, which means maybe you shouldn't have him in. You think he's not gonna do well, and and if you don't think he's gonna do well. Like, why even waste any of your lineups on them? So th- I think that's all 100% right here. Now, let's – from their point of view, though, from their strategy, and I'm saying like someone who doesn't do it the way I do it, doesn't use a sim, kind of just takes projections and then, and then and then uses their gut, let's say. I think actually that's not a horrible strategy to X out guys. If you're – if you – because if you have no – you know, scientific basis for picking lineups. You really are just using your gut, like for for a big portion of it. Like you're using the projections in concert with your with what you think. And so, if if you do have a guy, I know it sounds like I'm contradicting myself from five seconds ago, but I'm I don't think I am. If you have a guy at two percent in your exposures, but he's actually thirty percent own, and you're just doing all this by your gut, you can X him out. I think you can X him out. Like I don't think you're losing or gaining anything there. And if you and if in 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 shrinking your your player pool, uh, might actually benefit someone who's kind of just, you know, going by the gut and eyeballing it. So but in in that individual case, when when mathematically, if we go, I, I think you're saying the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. If a guy that is thirty percent on, let's say that's chalk on this, let's a chalky right. type of guy. If you if you're building 150 lineups and he only shows up in two of them, like the two lineups that he shows up in are not like your highest line. Like you're talking about the difference. If you X'd him out, all that would do is change your 138th and 147th lineup to really ch- you're ending up playing the 164th best lineup and the 178th best lineup. And the difference between like those lineups right at the bottom of that 150 are not that dramatically different that if you did X them out, you're not right. missing on it. You're not like, it's very, how, how often does a guy in a one fifty set show up 3% of the time? And the 3% of lineups are like in the top 10, like projected. They don't, that, that that's the reason they only show up in 3% of the, the lineups. Yeah. I mean, you, you could even say like they're top 200 or 300 lineups. There's not a ton of difference in some of those, in some of those projections, like it depends on the sport, but they, they get pretty close. They get within points for, you know, many, many lineups. And that's just like a three in the NBA, you know, just making or missing a three. So, um, yeah, definitely the top 150 and 149, 148, how much difference is there? But like, for the, the, like I'm not trying to give what I think what I'm trying to say here is I'm not trying to give like a hard and hard and fast rule. I'm saying that it's okay to go under, and and certainly if you're doing some sort of scientific process to come to your lineup, your 150, you go with it. And if you're not, and you're kind of going by your gut, there's nothing wrong with xing out that bottom, well under, uh, you know, whatever, 15, 20 percent under the field guys that you just have a few of to get a couple extra of the guys that you like. I mean, I think you're kind of 
you know, it's just gambling. It's just gambling <laughs> at that point, right? So, so go go with it. <laughs> do you do you think that the methodology that I use is gut related? Because I don't. Uh, yeah, but- I'm, I'm not entirely. I'm not entirely. I don't have. I don't know your exact process. I never seen what you do. But um, there probably is some some element to it. I mean, there is some element to what everyone's doing. I mean, right. But I think I, it's a, what's, like the the, what's the difference? What's the difference between gut and estimation? Like, I think what I do is estimation. Like to me, gut means I think this guy's going to do it. Like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything by gut. Or I could think and go, I believe that this guy's going to be overowned. And although I'm not making an exact mathematical calculation on that, I'll be like. He's projected around the industry at thirty two percent owned based on uh, based on the projections that I have. He shouldn't be thirty. He should be like twenty six percent owned. And if he comes in at thirty eight percent owned when it's actual, it's like thank God I don't have as much of him. But like I didn't make an exact number there. I didn't run a sim or anything. I'm just looking and going. What lineups do I believe are directionally higher EV than other lineups based on? Like my gut of what the field is going to do, because I already have the projections and I have to just throw up my hands. I trust the model, whatever it says, even if I aggregate. And and then I'm making the gut decision of I'm going to play this guy in less or more of my line. A, a guy's 4% owned that should be 12% owned. And I'm like, I'm getting a lot of relative value here. Let me jam this guy into more of my lineups. Like, is that gut or just is that I'm building my 100 set based on an estimation that I'm directionally right, but I'm not like, like to me, that's not gut. That's just well, I mean, like, it's, it's a comp, it's a complicated question. It, like if, if we're going to, if we're going to like really, really simplify it between scientific, scientific and gut, you, you could, you could make some examples for it. But of course, gut is like, you know, back in the poker days, you, you're, you, you were a gut player. Everyone was a gut player before game theory got popular you learned from playing at the tables basically you read a few books then you played a shit ton of poker that's that's gut right but and the same thing with dfs there's a lot of guys who could probably guess ownership to like a 0.8 r if they really wrote down their results instead of me i do mine you know through regressions and stuff and they could probably come close to me or who knows maybe some of them could beat me in their ownership projections just by experience so I mean, if you're conflating, and then there's also like game theory. Like if you if you can, if you could just think of you know certain game theory situations. Like my first ownership video, and about about game theory. Like if you if you just kind of think about it uh, the way I was explaining it there, you'd be like, oh okay. Now I can just go look at the ownership and like, okay, this guy and this guy have the same ownership projection, but this guy's five percent owner uh, more owned. I can take this guy and I actually auto profit. You know, and, and it's like that's, that's but is that gut? gut? But but the thing is, is that it's not is that you're not gut? doing any science? You're but just it, thinking. Yeah, but the difference is, is that for instance, like you're you're doing a sim, you're simulating contests, you're simulating sli- like you're you're saying if we played this like that's always my as always my example. Make the decisions you would make as if your this slate would played out ten thousand, hundred thousand times. Which shows more profit. And as long as you continue to make those decisions, just like we'd say that in poker, right? May, hey, if you get if it's the right percentage play and you're making a you know three bet here and the fold equity is twenty percent and it's like what whatever happens in the hand doesn't matter that specific hand as long as long as you're plus EV each and every decision. Uh, what would be the diff? What's is what's the difference between someone doing that quote by gut? Quote by taking that right game theory, but like, like this, this is where, where we always go back and forth. I I always exaggerate to say that that you're that you tend to be more concerned about being exact, and I don't care about being exact. And if if the if the contests and the fields were much 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 more more sharper, you're gonna crush me, like because obviously the what the people that are the most accurate over time are going to be you know, are going to beat the directionally accurate people but i take a look at these contests and we see you know half the field sometimes that it's like what the fuck are these people doing right <laughs> right so it's like like in the grand scheme of things and i think you've said this on on lulls before that like you don't have to do your scientific t- 
type of method. You, it, you're going to be better than me, but there's still enough bad players. And they're not as bad as they were eight years ago, but there's still enough average players that like my methodology, which is kind of like in the middle of that, closer to yours, but not as scientific, just using game theory could still be profitable. Yeah, for sure. Like like I said, the definition of of gut is the problem here, I think, where like if I, if like I'm just throwing it out hyperbolic on a podcast with Pete, you know, what I mean, I'm just talking about some dummy who wears his Bears hat, you know, flat build and uh, he's got a Buckets jersey. And I got a Buckets jersey. Actually, I'm just kidding. But you know what I'm saying? Just like put throwing in Trubisky lineups and winning a million bucks when he runs for three touchdowns or something versus someone who's like running a regression to guess what. Trubisky will do in this type of game environment against this type of opponent. But to be honest, even running regressions is a lot of gut work. So like you're guessing at what variables you think impact this um, constant. So like you don't really, we don't, I don't really know. I am guessing. And then you just, you just keep guessing like, okay, well, does this matter? Well, does this matter? And then it's a pain in the ass. You take, you're constantly taking things out. Same thing with trying to guess ownership. Okay. Well, how does this affect ownership? How does it, let's throw this in there. Let's throw this in there. So there is a lot of guesswork, but eventually I think if you're somewhat good, I'm no scientist, obviously anyways, but like, I'm just a gambler, but like I, you, but everyone has access to the internet. So like you can figure this stuff out too. Not you, Jen, just the average listener. But like, if you, once you're like guessing at ownership, it's the same way too. Like, okay, well, how does this affect it? How does this affect it? And, um, but if you are good, like you'll recognize that some things don't and some things do. Um, you can look at their P values and test them against uh, in sample and out of sample things. And then the closer you get, uh, the, the better, the better you are and the less gut you're using. But like, like we said, this is a spectrum and guts just like kind of a word where you, you know, just uses like a the pejorative. Spe- is, that's what we're calling it. The gut spectrum, <laughs> the gut spectrum, <laughs> it applies to everything on some level. But like, here's another thing you could you could do this if you're if you're a gut player, is you could take Roto Grinders ownership projections, Osmo's ownership projections, whatever, and track them, and then run an R on them, see who's better. Like you can still even improve, you know, using stats, non gut related things or less gut related things, and improve your process over time without. Without just watching, you know, NFL Rewind uh, for twelve hours a week or whatever. What the the, the twenty the all twenty two or whatever. Whatever the, the, whatever, <laughs> whatever the they call it. Say. I don't know. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> it's the, the it's those the, the the all the all Pete, Pete's buddies and stuff that like, watched all these rewind all these rewind shows. Like, how do you put in eight hours of game game film? I couldn't. Right, do I don't it. even watch the games live as it is. <laughs> I watch Red Zone. And, right, I, that's what I do. I watch Red Zone yeah. also, but I but yeah. But like in basketball, like like how am I yeah. watching the game? I don't I don't even. Like, I haven't watched a basketball game or baseball game in like two years, right. <laughs> maybe, maybe three or four. Right, but but from to to get away from like the the most scientific method, mm-hmm. like from the gut perspective, like you mentioned R, and obviously R is you know a measurement of of correlation, right? So obviously an R of one means that it's. Yeah, obviously, if your projections had an R of one, you'd literally win all the money, right? The measurement be... of the variance in the in the coefficient, right? The definition. Uh, uh, but, but you could know, like, if you're saying, like, you're guessing, like, you know that you're to me, you know that you're a bad player when you're like, oh, this guy's, oh, this guy's gonna be forty percent owned, and you play a bunch of them, and he comes in at four percent owned, right? Yeah. Like if like if you're like oh this guy's gonna be a sneaky play and he comes in at sixty eight percent on like like at that point like this is this is obviously someone that may not be looking at ownership projections that are done in some scientific matter whether it be the most accurate or not but there are tons of players that you know like it, it's always weird especially during the football season Brian uh, when I do my streams on Saturdays because I get a lot of new people. And uh, that that's when it turns into stupid Saturdays. That's why people, and then people like when the new people come in and I just yell at them because it's entertaining. Uh, and I'm not angry. It's just that it's more entertaining to do it that way. Uh, and people will legitimately not know how owned anyone, like, like, oh, I'm going to play the sneaky. It, 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 it ends up like every week to be that. And then I, 
It's like, how are you ever going to be good at DFS if you can't even gauge, like, what a good play is to begin with and what people, other people think is a good play? So do you think the starting point from there, like, you wouldn't tell someone that has no math statistical background, no programming background, no poker background even, to go, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to run regression. You need, Like, you start using, you say, okay, you know Excel? You're going to have to take a master course in Excel in order to learn <laughs> all the functions, right? Of, like, like people just tune themselves out on that. So what would, what would you recommend to people that are at the point where they're not even sure what, like, the, quote, best projected plays, like, to me, my attitude is spend the 40 bucks, spend the hundred, but whatever it is, like it'll save you so much time. Like you have the answer, like Roto Grinders has the answers. Autosomo has the answers. ETR for football or NBA, like, like they're all cl- fantasy labs, whatever. They're still, all of those places are still going to be closer than you with nothing. But if you yeah. weren't going to subscribe to a site or something or, and not, and you don't want to build your own model, do you believe that, in my opinion, this is what I what I say, is that the best way to get good at GPPs is to get decently good at cash games? Because at least in the double-ups, like, it focuses on, like, who's the best value? And once you study cash game players and you play, even if you're playing low stakes, like, once you know what other people are going to do, because obviously they're the best values, then you at least know, like, how to get different from that. Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I would I would say you probably should you know, cash out and buy a gold and Bitcoin or something. <laughs> How about the tops wooden coins? Are you in the tops NFTs? <laughs> no, but I did just make a joke tweet. I haven't even checked it out yet. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it reminds me of, of being a kid with those tops baseball cards, so it is a little intriguing. But um, I do I do this on my the the videos I do, um, just like the instructional videos I do with, without Pete. Um, I always try to put in there, like, I, I know you're going to gamble anyways, so (laughs) here's what I would do if I was you, (laughs) you know, type of thing. And so like, and it's true, like, and I do it my, I do it. I just bet a grand on Jake Paul this, this last week. So like, like people like gambling and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that in my opinion. And, uh, and, and it it makes, it makes sports a lot more fun. It makes a lot of things more fun. And also I think gambling is kind of like gut. The definition is so wide. It, like, I mean, you don't think like being in a relationship with a person's a gamble in your life. Like, come on, you, you know, you don't think going to college is a gamble. Spending that money is a gamble. There's uh, taking a job might be it. There's lots of risks in life. Everything, you know, everything's a gamble. So like, go fuck yourself if you don't, if you don't like gambling. So like, if you're going to gamble, you know, have at it, but yeah, you probably do want to do, uh, one of the one of the content sites. Um, I guess it depends on the stakes too, Jordan. Like, you know, like, are you pe- are you playing five bucks a day? Uh, and then maybe not. Maybe just try to get lucky. If you're well, playing, it, it depends on what your day. goal is. I mean, I mean, I I mean, although I play cash games, I played at a volume where the raw money is at least somewhat worth it to me. But a lot of people with a hundred dollar bankrolls, which I don't even think is a bankroll to begin with, right? Uh, like, like. You're not just, you're not going to win enough money. Like if your goal is to become a high stakes cash player, yeah. I could see a value in, I'm going to, pl- I'm going to have my $500 bankroll and I'm going to play $50 a slate. And then five years from now, I'll be playing 20,000, 30,000 a slate and you want to get good. But if that's not your goal, like to me, like the GP, yeah, like yeah, that's pl- the, see that's. Do you remember this? What was this whole poker book? It was when those all the poker players started writing their own. Remember Cole South wrote his own book and a couple of the other guys wrote their own book. God, I can't remember the name of it. But one of the lines in there was – it wasn't Cole's book. It was somebody else's. It was um, – he like whenever he teaches players, he knows which ones will be good. And the ones who want to make money never turn out to be good. And the ones that want to be – learn – or, or you know, be uh, high level players always turn out to be good. The ones that care about money don't. So like, and I'm not saying you should do either one, but like, if you're just in it for money, you want to play like tennis, 
and MMA in these smaller sites, Superdraft and stuff like Yahoo maybe, although that's getting kind of tough. And look at the new ones that I'm not on. Who knows? There's probably other ones out there, the prop betting sites or blah, blah, blah. If you're just looking to build a bankroll, you don't need to hop into the $500 NBA, you know, uh, 100K to first because you're going to get you're, – you're going to – you might get lucky, obviously, but if you're probably not, it's pretty tough. There's like all good players in there at this point. Right. The, the, um, the, the average, the average, like, because people ask me that also, like I don't play those contests because the average, the strength of an average lineup is so much higher. Yeah. So, but I, but, but this gets into the point that we were, you were talking about, you've been talking about recently that it's, it's the battle that I've had the past probably five years, maybe three years that it's hard for me to download TSVs from these large field contests. It's hard for me to look through and see how much dead money there is in there and not, and not think like the number one thing is to go after the weakest opponents, even though these payout curves are just fucking stupid. Like, like you have to bink in order to make a pro like you have to bink at least, at least at my level once a year, to make a profit, but I'm also not max entering. Uh, and then when I take a look at the single entry stuff where it's like the 555 or something or four max 250, and I go, okay, payout structure is a little bit better. That mm -hmm. I I don't have to be as nuts. So the swings aren't as dramatic. I could actually play two, three lineups into it instead. And yes, winning isn't 100,000, but it's, you know, 10,000, 20,000. But right. then I look at the lineups in the contest and go, like, fuck, like, everyone's good. Like, like no one's making obvious mistakes. No one's playing their cash. There's some some people are playing their cash lineups in there. Yeah. Uh, but, like, why, why? It's like, uh, it's in poker of, like, do I want to play a 5,000-person World Series of Poker main event? Or do I want to play the, the, the four-table, you know, $50,000 buy-in super everything where Tom Dwan's in where I look around is like, like there's no, some, some rich, there may be one or two like rich businessmen types that you're like, okay, they have no shot, but like everyone else is like, I'm not going to be surprised if they won. Like, how do I reconcile the fact that I want to play where the weak players are, but yeah. these payout curves make it so that it's like, how much of a bankroll do I need in order to realize that? <laughs> right. But here, you're a different breed too, as well. Like if you if you have the bankroll, of course you take advantage of a lot of these situations. But if you're, st I'm saying if you're starting small, right? And uh, and I was also trying to distinguish with that poker book analogy. Like if you want to be good, then you got to do what I'm saying. You have to. You gotta. You gotta. Get, you gotta get into some statistics. You gotta get pretty good at Excel. You gotta kind of do some of these things if you want to be good. If you want to make money right now, you can. There's smaller sites. There's smaller opportunities. When I was coming from poker, too, and the reason I um, uh, I, I had a real job after Black Friday, but um, uh, I, I saw my um, my brother-in-law at the time. He was he goes check this out. I'm 73rd place out of like 300,000 people in the NFL, and I was like, there's 300,000 people that play <laughs> DFS, right? And from poker, exact same thought you had. It's like I can beat enough. Uh, if there's 300,000, like I figure out where I can beat enough to make some money. And then I, I looked into it and it's like, you could play every table down to like one penny. What well, table there, you know, like if, if, the, if you could do that on poker stars and like, I would, I would probably anything over 10 tables, I was probably starting to lose EV where it wasn't worth it, but I would probably still play more than that. But like around there was about my max. But if I could play every level, every table, and I was like, okay, I'm going to put time into this. Like that was really one of the selling points. You can't do that anymore. They limit you to $5. So that's another thing. If you're not limited, play everything under $5. Play the smaller sports. Play the smaller sites. Um, see if you can get bonuses. It's it, This is kind of how poker was too back in the early days. Is you, just, you just lop up that free money they're giving out um, and build your bankroll. And then maybe then, then start Googling around the ideas I'm talking about. Right. Then start taking some chances, but you need a bank. You need a, a big, big bankroll to play these top heavy now top heavy hundred uh, K to first. What was yesterday in the NBA was like, or one of them was like hundred K to first, twenty five K to second. 
It's like this is getting more and more like a winner take all. And you have to adjust your strategy, your bankroll strategy with this stuff. Well, you were you were talking about as far as the 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 point in which max entering is not is not, you know, the most opt the most optimal. And it's something that I've done for ever like this is you could I'm I'm asking you I'm, I'm right as of right now I'm asking you for help because the one of the things you know I post all my results I'm very transparent I you know, I know I'm a nit I know I don't I'm I'm pretty conservative but it's hard to I do it because it's hard for other people it's hard for you as a person to judge whether or not you're on the right path without seeing the examples from other people so like I don't know so like when it comes in, I mean, we both know what Kelly is. Like when you'd like the optimal wager based on like the edge right. that you have, like, especially in some of the videos that you've done on YouTube where you show that like, do you have an edge or do you not have an edge? In DFS, it's extremely hard to figure that out. And even after three years, it's hard to, I mean, even after a large sample size, it's hard to figure out, did, did I bink 100K? Because I actually with a negative EV lineup and I'm just like, I'm just riding the wave until I go broke or am I actually good at this? Now, obviously as the larger, the sample gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you're more and more likely to be closer to that. But it's still, I mean, I've posited that it's possible that no one has the sample size in, in the history of DFS to be within one standard deviation of what their true edge is. So then how do you determine what the bankroll is? Like, how do you, how could you, how how could you think of Kelly in any terms when it's asking you like, well, what's your edge? It's like, well, it could be 3%. It could be negative 3%. So what is, how much money should I be wagering? So like I err on the side of, uh, yeah, based on a five and a half year sample size, this is my ROI. And this is, you know, and even if I cut off the top 1%, the bottom, you know, kind of, you know, to even it out, it's this. How much can I trust that? And it's like, if it says like, oh, you should be playing $25,000, you should be playing 12% of your bankroll per slate. And I'm like, but what if I'm wrong? And if I'm wrong, like, what am I just going to lose $100,000 for being, I'd rather just err on the side of like, worst case scenario, I've just left a lot of money on the table. Like worst case scenario, I should have a half a million more dollars and I'm more likely to live with that than, say, oh, I'm going to invest all my money and lose it. Yeah. Is that a bad Every, attitude to have? Everyone's situation's different though, right? Like everyone's situation's different. But yeah, bankroll management, especially now, is so key. And and are you an, are you a favorite? Are you, you know, like, let's think about poker. Was the best poker player, online poker player in 2002, the best in 2006? Was he even still profitable? Probably not. Was the best in 2006, the best in 2008? No, probably not. Still profitable. Is the best in 2011? even can even win now on poker stars. Not that we're allowed to play, but no way. I, I seriously doubt it. Like maybe some of them, you know, maybe Phil Galfon or somebody like that, but like you never in baseball or not baseball, but sports in general is also like, okay, well now guess what? Here's COVID. How, how, how good are you going to be now? Like COVID, COVID, I was crushed in the beginning of the year. COVID happened. Obviously there was no sports to play for a while, but when it came back, I just, I didn't just didn't win for a while. And it's like, is the is this COVID thing totally different than, especially since I'm using a whole bunch of old data, like uh, maybe this is maybe I can't win anymore. You know what I mean? And then now that it's back, there's some some fans in the audience. Does that change home field advantage? Um, there's more content sites available, right? There is their information getting better. They're hiring better and better people, you know, uh, for to to produce their content are my projections even worth it anymore? You know, these, these are questions you constantly have to ask yourself. And I don't think there's an answer. And if Nelson Adcock, uh, on Twitter, he did a, um, he does like little Sims occasionally like bankroll Sims. So people could check him out. It was a while ago. So I don't know how you'd find it, but where he was showing, um, like if you have like a, what, a, you know, whatever percent edge, and the swings your bankroll and it's just insane. And it's, and, and let me tell you in real life, it's just as crazy. And, um, and I said to him something like, so you could theoretically have an X percent edge and never win in your life, a big GPP. And he goes, absolutely. And I'm like, uh, cause that's the answer. I knew it. I just wanted him to. Well, like, only, only cause it applies to you. 
<laughs> right? Because because you're you're the classic, right? Like uh, like you didn't win the millie, so that anyone that wins the millie, it's frost, <laughs> it's all luck, right? The millie is all luck until, until you until win. I win it, right. then it's all skill. <laughs> But, but like, I mean, if you just think about these things, like, uh, you know, simple math in your head. So there's a 300,000 person tournament. Let's say you're average. Everyone's average. You would win one in 300,000 right. years. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you play it once a year. Football's only 16, 17 weeks besides the playoff. So, so it's 17 times. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Oh, but you have 150 entries, Brian. You could cover all your bases. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I had this guy in my Discord telling me that, and I'm like, I'm to be nice. Okay. Can, be can, nice. Can, can 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 you pl- can can how ridiculous, like the combinatronics of like even even in like smaller sports, like even in like MMA on a 14 fight card. I'm not even talking about a nine fight card, but a 14 fight card. It's like, yeah. oh, you can cover all of them in 150. It's like, have you? This is not hard math to do. Yeah. Like, there's obviously way, way more than 100. And then when we talk about baseball, a base, yeah. a 13 game slate baseball slate, you can cover yeah. all. You could stack everyone every different way with two pitchers on DraftKings with 150 lines. Like, dude, like the number yeah. is is. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions upon millions of combinations. When they moved the cap, when DraftKings and the sites moved the cap from whatever, I think it was unlimited, then 500, then 150, whatever it was, that 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 saved recreational players money, not because I get to put in 500, because you don't have a chance to blow even more than 150. Like, it's like, if, you, if you're not good and you put in one, 150 laps, and let's just say the, the $15 or whatever, 100K to first, something like that, like, I mean, you could easily lose 100 grand in a month, easily, easily. Um even if you're good, you could lose a hundred grand. Even if you're good, that's what I'm saying. Like if you're, and um, this kind of goes to like just like projections in general is like, like they they uh, like I was listening to, I listened to your last episode with um, uh, uh, Dave Dave Potts, hmm. right? Dave Potts two, Dave Potts one. You guys should check uh, check out who Dave Potts one is on my Twitter feed. Um, interesting <laughs> fellow. Um, so like they projections I, I i i agree with your guys overall general take anyways but like projections do matter in the sense of like if you if you like because people uh, who have played as much as i do i'm sure this probably happened to you too like if you screw up and you paste like the wrong thing in and you don't notice <laughs> and then that slate goes off and you're like how did i lose every single penny it's like oh my god i pasted in the wrong i based it in whatever strikeouts into the points field or something and these are just all backwards like you will lose every penny you have if you just if you have garbage projections and then one other slight caveat there well there's two two more things on that one is like 10 percent projections matter it does matter especially in the nba so like if a guy gets ruled out and and this happened like last year and i and i and i got lucky and won the tournament tyler hero was like announced the starter there wasn't a lot of time left and i got like 80 percent, and the field only got to like eight or nine percent but like i think like the popular sites had him at like 28 minutes played and i had him like 32 right all it was was like a little 10 percent difference in the projections but i it mattered big time on that specific slate so and 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 there are other ways to use projections than just optimizers isn't that what i'm is, you know what i mean right. like home runs matter in right. baseball you still got to project how many home runs this guy's going to hit, how many home runs this guy's going to give up. Like, they, they, like, there's obvious things that that matter that, and you could use all those, like stat projections specifically in creative ways outside of crunchers. So, but like the general idea that you guys are saying is like, especially with baseball, where it's like projections don't matter as much as you people give them credit for, especially if you're not making your own. I totally agree with that. But those are like three little caveats I had. Right, but it's the but we're talking about the mean and median. Right. Like, like I get people that ask me because they come from NBA and they say, well, how much, how many points off the optimal can I be for MLB? And I go, dude, one swing of the bat is 14 points. I mean, like, yeah. like, dude, like you could have lineups that based on a median projection, like, are like 30, 40 points off, but like you're playing a 1% don't stack. And like the ceiling of a 1% <clears throat> don't stack is still 15 runs. Yeah. And like, dude, it doesn't even matter at that point. So in like, the NBA, it matters a lot more, but right. like. But but like 0.47 projected home runs for Stanton matters compared to 0.001 home runs for whatever slap hitting shortstop. Right. Like that 
You can't just say that doesn't matter. Like it, that does matter. The, the the fantasy mean projections that you get from some sort of content provider is yeah I get it like they 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 have a whole bunch of stuff in there where you don't know how many singles a guy's gonna get blah 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 I get it but Stanton is significantly more likely to hit a home run which matters significantly more in DFS than the slap hitter although their medians might be like the slap hitter is projected for eight and Stanton's projected for twelve five because the slap hitter might get a steal or something you know what I mean like like. They they do matter. The variance um, and is you higher. Could see, you could see this if you if you go through the data and go through historical games and projections and check the R and see what matters and stuff like that. And certain things matter and certain things don't matter as much as far as winning GPPs in DFS. But aren't, so, aren't isn't it essentially what you're saying is that the range of outcomes yeah. is wide. I mean, the difference between the slap, like the difference between. Uh, uh, even at the five thousand forty five hundred dollar level for baseball, I mean, we're talking about an event driven sport where the guy that's forty six hundred, that you know, the 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 guy that hits three hundred, it's like in his range of outcomes. Like if you say both of their means or medians is eight and a half, mm-hmm. it's like one guy has a lot of sixes and sevens and eights and fours and nines. Well, one guy has a lot of threes and twenties, mm-hmm. and it's like. For GPPs, you want to have the guy that has threes and twenties. But the optimizer, if you're using just a piece of software and it it yeah. doesn't know, right? It just it looks right. at that column and get, I want to give you as much of the the that that one F points column, which is a mean or a median. Do you believe that even with the tools that are available now and the projections that are available now, that more people mess up? using the software like with without it for instance like you're running simulations you're run like you're you're strategizing you're coming up with game theory you're 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 computing what the best line of for specific contests are or a large field gpp that's so much different than like if i were to go to fantasy cruncher and uploaded projections whatever projections it doesn't matter and i just say give me uh in baseball like, just give me the top of a median projected line. It's 150 of them. Like, there would be no stacks in them. There would be barely any. I mean, you'd be playing yeah. 98% of one pitcher. Like, now, obviously, there may not be people that go to that extent where they're just basically hitting a button with right. one unique player there and then wondering why all their lineups lose or all their lineups win. Yeah. Like, the tools in and of themselves, do you, do you believe that? I think so, because I have to teach this to a lot of people. Oh, yeah, the, the grinders. Tools. Yeah, the tools matter for sure, but still, even the median projections. Like, okay, let's say you flipped, you flipped all the projections, completely flipped them upside down for the players who are actually playing. So Stanton's thirteen now goes to the bottom guy, and the bottom guy's number goes to Stanton. Like, you're gonna lose all your money eventually. Like, you can't just throw away even median projections. But like, but but I still kind of I agree with like the overall sentiment of what you guys are saying is like if you're using an optimizer you can't just crunch the projections medium projections are not as important as the distribution of outcomes for sure I agree with all that but like if you want to take it to the next level you can't just like be like oh projections don't matter in my opinion like you have to go like okay what projections do matter how can I use these how can I figure out the distributions going forward and how much does that apply you know, in this lineup, in this slate today, stuff like that. Those are like the questions you actually want to answer that you can't. And when I'm t- saying projections here, I'm saying stat projections, you know, not right. just DFS content provider, median projections. Right. And to, in, in a sport like baseball, especially since it's more correlated, mm-hmm. what's the value difference between, I don't know how, how you run your Sims, yeah. but I'm, assu- I'm assuming you don't just run them individual player base. Um, or do you? No, 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 no. But I'm no just, I, I, I want I wanted you to explain the difference. Well, between, I'm not going to explain what I do, but no, I'm not going to expl- <laughs> not explain exactly what you do. But the difference yeah. between like a lot of content sites and projection models that are around yeah. the industry, they simulate the range of outcomes on an individual player basis. Yeah. Why is that not as valuable as a different simulation methodology? Um, because there's more interactions. Right. There's more interactions than that. Um, and also, like, I don't know how they're doing their simulations. They're probably using a normal distribution on 
uh, fantasy points, and that's not super useful. It's actually it's, it's pretty useful compared to like 2000 whatever 15. You know, you're way ahead of the curve. But um, yeah, that, that is it. Is it a normal distribution? I don't. A lot of times it's not. No. So it depends on what the distribution looks like. Um, and uh, and and also th- there's more interact. Like I said, more interactions than just okay, this horse race, what I call them is horse race simulation. So like what point guard will score the most points based on the normal distribution of of these these content providers' median projections, which is basically how everyone does it as far as I can tell. So like that doesn't tell you, okay, like, like that doesn't help you find out the leverage you want to do. And then, you know, not necessarily. Like, and, and um, you know, like there, a lot of times it's the same source. So like it's the same projections is the same ownership projections like they're coming from the same company so it's like well how are you going to get leverage on this guy making the same information type of thing too so there, there's other things there but um yeah like the, the the i'm fine with them i'm fine with the the you know the horse race simulations i just think if you do want to take it to the next level you got to get more complicated but still at this point you can still beat most of the field even with that yeah i guess maybe you guess? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, the, I think the games are a little harder than you're giving them credit for. I mean, but there's still, but there's still, there's still plenty of dead money. I mean, I think, but I think the opposite of you that when when you when you found out that a lot of the people that you're competing against like don't do what you do, mm-hmm. and like you're trying to beat them and they're winning also, like at what point? I, this is not me saying that what you do doesn't matter. But mm-hmm. how much more does it matter? Like, right? That, yeah. but that isn't really that's the question. I'm if it matters a lot more, sure. Like, I'm getting, I get to the point where like time versus, you know, the resources versus like what's it worth. Now, obviously, we saw poker. Like, once solvers came in, obviously, I, I played online poker before HUDs. Then once HUDs came in, that, that made the games in, way harder. Because now everyone has a dossier and everyone and everything like, and then solvers came in, and now it's like I'll play live poker. I could beat these dummies live. I could I could use my 2006 style strategy <laughs> and beat these guys. But like, do you, I don't think the games in DFS have gotten to the point of that. Where how much more are you beating? Uh, like, I think the better question is. Is your goal to beat better players or is to find the weaker player? Like, I think we both we both approach DFS from a, maybe a slightly different perspective. That my goal is to find the weakest players and beat them in whatever means I could find necessary. Mm-hmm. And then once I start seeing that, like, there's no more weaker players, then it's either I have to get better or I just don't play DFS anymore. And I go, I try to, I hope peer-to-peer sports betting starts coming out and start getting into different waters or go, go to the different sites, go to super draft, go to, you know, find where those players are. And I think you come from the perspective of like, you want to, yours is probably more sustainable of, you would just want to have the best process. So it doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter how strong or weak you'd rather play against the weakest players possible. But if you're playing against other strong players, as long as you're slightly stronger than them, you're still going to make money. I've, I've always just been into this too. Like I love Billy Bean and Moneyball back in the day and Bill James. I had all the Bill James almanacs and I would make, you know, my own minor league projections and stuff like that. And I worked in baseball after college. And so I just have always been into it. But I I do think, yeah, for long term sustain sustainability, unless you want to be the two thousand six poker player playing it. I, I think DFS will get just get harder. The dead money will dry up. The promotions will go away, especially when they really lock down the the like two or three sites that remain that the states will approve because no one's going to have the money to get into the the regulated market eventually. Uh, yeah, I think you, if, if you want to though, I mean, you know what I mean? Like maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't want, so I like enjoy it to some degree in the moment. I don't to some degree. <laughs> I'm out. It is a little annoying. And sometimes, you know, NBA, uh, how do you yeah. how are you dealing with NBA? This this is it's like yeah yeah. I just last night I there was one more injury rule out and I had to get up and go back on my computer and I'm like maybe I should just 
Didn't, didn't and, one team release injuries lose like 10 minutes after lock or something? Oh, they do that all the time. They do it all the time. No, but after it's, the lock of their own game. Yeah, sure. They Or they'll release a starting lineup after the lock right. of their own game. Yeah. But you still don't yeah, mind no. playing. Like, I, I got to the point where, like, there, there's, there's an edge here, obviously, because late swap, you know. Right. Doing all of that is, like, I know, I know I'm giving up money, but it's like, I also, like, I don't want an ulcer. Like, it's just like, one of the... I also maybe after four months of playing NBA, I maybe want seven o'clock to 11 o'clock in my life to be like kind of stress free. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. I, I'd be happy if they went back to no late swap and you suck it up. You guy, you 40% of your guy gets ruled out. Well, hopefully I'm on the right side of those coin flips throughout the rest of the season. At least I don't have to sit at my computer for six hours. It's pretty, it's pretty annoying, but you have, you have absolutely have to do it. And if you want to make it, if you want to make money, you don't have to do it. You don't have to be, you don't have to get, I'm talking back about like statistics and stuff like that. You don't have to do it. You, there's ways to make money all over the place. If you look for it, it's right. Probably, digital and, horses, and right. We could just race our digital horses. You race your digital horses. You could sell your top shot for a million dollars. Sell your your tops wooden cards for you know who knows What's how much. What's up with that? Aren't, aren't they supposed to be actual cards? I guess I don't know. I have, honestly I haven't looked. I was just reading everyone's <laughs> tweets. That's how I get all my information. On. I just saw it, I, like oh, okay, they're selling baseball moments. So I'm expecting, you know, I know they they don't have moments for tops. It's just like a digital image. And then everyone's it's, like, no, it's just these wooden chips or something. I'm like, are people that stupid now? Like, I thought well, they were stupid three months ago, and now, it's, now things are getting stupider. It's also the com- company that's, like, notorious for ruining the baseball card industry in the right. 80s by printing trillions of cards. Right. And you're like, no, but this time is different. <laughs> you, mean, you mean my 1988 them. top set isn't worth anything? Do you think if these NFTs go off that they're just going to be like, no, we're not going to print anymore? <laughs> We learned our lesson. I remember having so many sets of that 1988 tops, or the 1987 with the wood finish. Oh yeah, right. Oh, yeah. So like I got Thunder. Mark McGuire card. Yeah, so does Thunder everyone McGuire's. and their mother. Right. McGuire's, Conseco's, yeah. All those guys, Barry Bonds. There's some Sosa in there too, I think. Right, and then obviously the '89 upper deck Griffey card. Yeah, that's probably one. Yeah, that's probably like the last time, like the last ones I would actually buy. Had a couple year run there where I was into cards, but yeah, I I, I might buy the MMA because uh, Dapper is releasing. He's going to do MMA NFTs. I'm, I'll probably get some of those. I don't know. I've been in MMA lately just for fun. No, no, I don't know. I doubt anything's going to take off there, but I don't know about the baseball ones. Right, but we're we're on the opposite sides of 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 that. Yeah, like those, yeah, which, those which is which is perfectly perfectly reasonable position right. to have, in right. my opinion. People make fun of me for for I'm. Um, I'm I'm the Peter Schiff of uh of our, of our space of like, like yeah. no I don't have gold no I don't have any gold it's just crypto just like, I'll is, see you in uh, twenty I, years I, that that's all I say I, I love Peter Schiff I love Peter Schiff the the um it's a little it's a little religious the 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 crypto the crypto craze is a little I can notice by my my mentions like whenever I make like a joke tweet about Doge or something like that. People come out of the blue and it's like, you are not a, into the gambling world. How did you find me? <laughs> and why are you commenting on my, my, and they don't realize it's a joke, you know? So like, it's like, you're an idiot, blah, blah, blah. It's like, these people are insane. I thought I was Bitcoin crazy, you know, like years ago. It's like, these people are legitimately like, it, it's uh it's a religion. Now to me, I just, I just view that, that the whole space like that is it. It's this time it's different. And I don't want to pull pull the, like, yeah, I'm 42. I'm not that old. But, like, I lived, I worked on Wall Street during the dot-com boom as a web developer. Not as, not, I, not in the markets, but I knew stockbrokers. I, I mean, I was, I was on Wall Street. I, I developed the trading sites. So, like, I was involved in all that. And at that time where Yahoo's trading at $500 a share and these, com- anything dot-com, IPO'd it stock rocket to the moon and you could go into the grocery stores, you know, for lunch and the guys behind the counter have stocks and they're like, what's the new hot thing? Like <laughs> I've seen like it, I'm, I'm watching bit all the crypto stuff and the NFT stuff. And it's like, Oh, this is like the dot com boom. And then I, I started playing poker uh, professionally. And then I, I knew a lot of real estate guys 
And I do a lot of the real estate bros in 2004, 2005. They're like, dude, no money down. We could buy these properties. They were trying to convince me to invest. And it's like, dude, we don't even need money from you. We just need your credit score. So you, you, you put, you, you're going to buy the house. We'll supply the down payment, but we just need, uh, we can't get any more loans because we already have loans on 12 different properties. And they're like, dude, we flip these and we get 30,000 here. We get 50,000 there. Like I knew people that are like, dude, you like, dude, dude, you couldn't pass a high school anything. Like these are like the dumb people from high school. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then I look into this and I'm like, I don't want to take this risk. Yeah. Or whatever. And then obviously in 2008, everything fucking collapses. So it's like, I look at like this time it's different. And I'm like, no, right. it's not different. It's just different things. But the yeah. whole, the whole con, the whole economic concept ends up being the same thing. If you want to make a small bet that Bitcoin replaces world currency and, and you're into that concept. And maybe I am, maybe I'm pro that concept. Maybe I'm pro blockchain. Maybe this technology will solve smart contracts, everything. It's not like I don't get it. It's that I think a lot of people uh, think that change happens. You've, you've been, you've, you've been in government before. Yeah. Change is very fucking slow. (laughs) So it's like in my, like, that's why I say, see in 20 years, it's like, yeah. Cryptocurrency replacing, you know, the U S dollar. Yeah. Uh, If you want to make a bet that it happens 150 years from now, it's like, Okay, I could buy that. I'll be dead. Yeah. So, like, how much is my fucking Bitcoin going to be worth? I mean, that that's the kind of the attitude I come from. Like, I'm with you guys. Yeah. But, like, this shit doesn't, like, uh, the, the singularity ain't happening tomorrow. I mean, like, you yeah. could talk about the hyperloop all you want. This shit, I'm going to be dead before this happens. My my one counterpoint would be, you know, have fun stay, staying poor, Jordan. Have fun staying poor. <laughs> <laughs> it, how come it seems like most of the Bitcoin crowd? It, it's it, to me, it seems like uh, the the far, the, the right wing people, the cancel culture people. I don't know that it's not about believing in what you believe. It's about owning the people that don't. Right? Have fun staying poor. Isn't that all about? Oh. Like, it's like, no, no, it's more, I want to own Bitcoin. So I'm able to tell other people that don't own Bitcoin. Okay. Have fun saying poor yeah. because it's a cult. Like that you said, it's too religious. Yeah, no, it's like yeah, religion. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would, but there's, there's, there is the monetary thing where the, you know, putting, you know, saying like, you can't say that joke, Jordan. I'm, you know, is definitely, I'm better than you and I can, you know, right. look, well, I, I, I agree with you. you there also. Well, that, well, I think I thought that was the point you were trying to make, right. and then the Bitcoin guys are kind of doing, but the Bitcoin guys also make money. <laughs> where the as of people, right now, as of right as now, of right, it's just yeah, one it, long journey to zero. Imagine if you could monetize <laughs> wokeness or whatever. You know what I mean? Like if you're like, oh my god, my woke coin in 2008 was worth a penny, and now it's worth fifty five thousand dollars. I'm just gonna cancel everybody. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you would just get the world would go insane. Like you could also argue some of these people are getting monetized, but um, yeah, I mean the money, the money definitely does. It's definitely different than when I first started getting the Bitcoin. It was a lot of libertarian anarcho guys, you know, like. Uh, financial services. This is after, you know, Occupy Wall Street. This is after they started printing money in 2008. And, you know, a lot of these young guys have no, like you were saying, no clue about the, uh, you know, the dot com boom and all this other stuff. And they just think, like, in my opinion, <laughs> not financial advice, people. Not right, advice, of course, not financial not advice. Financial you have to advice. say that, right? This is, this is a clown economy. Everyone's getting rich. It doesn't matter what you invest in. It's all going up. You know, like today the stocks were bad, but within, you know, I mean, they're still at all time highs. doesn't, you can invest in, you know, NFT, you know, and I, I invested in all, I love all this stuff. I'm, I'm not, uh, um, you know, I'm not, not against it, but it's just like, I, I, it has to be the fed printing 60% of the world's money supply in eight months or whatever it was. Plus the 2008 still, we're still not even paying those ones off, just increasing asset prices and making the clown economy. I know that's Peter Schiff, you know, in a a nutshell there, and he's been wrong for a long time now after being right in 2008. Uh, But it just doesn't make any goddamn sense to me. But hey, I'm still, I'm a gambler, Jordan. I'm still rolling the dice. And I was a Bitcoin bro in the beginning. So I I love Bitcoin and and Ether. And so I'm still in there. Well, I'm on the other side of the spectrum for you. I'm I'm an MMT person. 
Oh yeah. Oh, well, oh yeah. Well, the, you're, my yeah. attitude is is that there's no such thing as inflation. It's just so, it's M- print as much as you want. Are so are so stupid that <laughs> like that you want them to print all this money and you're too dumb to get in and re- reap the benefits when the, all the asset prices go up. No, I am. I'm, I'm, in stock, I'm, I'm in the stock market. <laughs> Okay, I'm a nit. Uh, like I said, it's like, it's I'm, like just, I, I'm just joking, anyways. But right. like, yeah, but like, you're like, listen, buddy, if you're gonna print the money, at least get the rewards. Right. And like, who do you think this is gonna help? You think it's gonna actually help poor people? You think that poor people on the south side here no. have uh, NFTs and uh, no? But the, 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 what the, the, they need stocks, to do the sec, but they need to do the base. second thing. See, I'm I'm on the other side of the spectrum as you, right? On the not the gut spectrum. Print all the money you want, yeah, and tax the mother f- f- tax the shit out of. I mean, like that's there's not enough money to tax. There, 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 there's there's not a Jeff Bezos has tons of money. Get let's, let's you could get take all of money, money now. It wouldn't pay for one one hundredth of what we just printed in the last couple months. It's still better than nothing. We're fucking <laughs> let's tax these motherfuckers. <laughs> You're not gonna recoup the amount we printed. It was like a, a, a such a ridiculous amount. It doesn't make you could tax the entire country. Everything we got. It's not even close. It's nothing. Yeah, we're still here. We're doing fine. Yeah, well, I mean, it's Thomas Sowell, right? He's, I love Thomas Sowell. There are no solutions. There's only trade-offs. Right. You're trading the future for for the present. So we'll see. I'm going to be dead in 40 years. So as long as the future, <laughs> as long as the future is 41 years from now, I don't care. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, we all have different uh, time preferences. So yes. Right. I don't have any kids. So I don't need to leave anything. No, I don't care yeah. if, if the so day I'm, after I'm, I die, the world explodes. It's not going to matter to me. So why do you want to help people now then? <laughs> How am I helping so people now? So they don't rob you or something? I don't know. What's no, your... I, hell, I want I want health care. Hello. I mean, I'm, oh, a, I'm okay, an independent okay, okay, contractor, okay. right? Yeah. Right? So I, there's still a benefit to me, but I, that's what, I, but that's what I, I think when you live in the richest uh, country in the world, there should be no reason why, why someone can't go to the doctor. Like yeah, that, I, that, that's, that's where the, my liberal viewpoint, I, I'm a civil libertarian. I agree with you on a lot of, a lot of, you know, the constitutional issues, but when it comes to like, is there a reason why we're, we have the, the, the be, be, best country, the best nation in the history of civilization. And we have people that have to go to food banks. I mean, like, like to me that, that doesn't make sense. Like, let's take care of the basic needs of everyone first and then worry about people like okay, it's okay for you to make seventeen trillion dollars. Yeah, like the, the the best liberal liberal argument for me, and, and by the way, I was a gigantic liberal and worked in multiple <laughs> liberal administrations. But the best liberal argument for me is um, is is like okay, we could spend a uh, trillion dollars on these wars, but we can't pay for grandma's hip surgery. So like, if you wanted to take those that money end these wars, and take that money, even though. You 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 stole it from my neighbor. <laughs> I it's way better than bombing innocent people in uh, these countries we have no business being in, and you know just all sorts of other uh, other things. And you know you could see it with the money printing too. Yeah, they give you fourteen hundred bucks. Who's getting the rest of the trillions? Right. It's Every, not all the it's not people. grandma. It's not right. your neighbor. It's not the so and the the trust the social security trust fund is a is 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 uh, all IOUs. It's really is basically a Ponzi scheme. I mean, in literal practice, it's, we pay for the older people, then the younger people will pay for us, et cetera, et cetera. And it's empty. And they, 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 so like no one's getting benefits from this MMT. No, no, no poor people, no people you'd want to help are getting the benefits. Well, but we're, we're not doing MMT. We're just printing, we're just, the Fed's just putting a ton of shit on their balance sheet. Well, that's, that is MMT. Well, Emmett, you still have to tax people. You still, you still, you're controlling inflation through taxes. Not the whole concept of MMT is that that you don't have to pay. Like when people say, like, "Oh, you want universal health care? How are you going to pay for it?" It's like, well, you don't have to pay. Like taxes don't pay for things. Taxes, you you do the balance as long as people are productive. I mean, really, the boogeyman of MMT is full employment because obviously, once you have full employment, you can't increase your GDP. Which means you shouldn't be printing more money because it should equal that. Like that's what modern monetary theory is. So if you're if all you're doing is printing money, but you're not you're not solving the other two things, like then it's not really MMT. All it is is just we're just printing okay. just inflation. Okay, I yeah, I I guess. 
Yeah. If you're not, if you're not taxing back and uh, it's basically like taking a loan out on yourself, but like on the country and then paying it back. But like, and you're saying they're not going to tax them, which is totally true. But I still think of my, and maybe the, the actual economic definition and maybe I'm wrong is, is, uh, is just using the government to print, to, 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 to use money to, for all these sort of services and, as long as you get the GDP, as long as you get the productivity. I mean, that the whole point is to print it so that we can build new roads and well, build in, new, yeah, and do things with it, not just like I'm um, not just give it away to people, not just like literally just print it. Like it's not UBI. Like UBI means here's well, money I, and you, there's no productivity attached to it. Yeah, that. Well, I mean, they they might argue differently, but yeah, I think I think that's still. I think UBI might fall under MMT if they did it. Well, it, as long as they tax it back, then it does. I mean, like that's the. You have to make up the difference in the lack yeah. of productivity. So, like, which that's... is not which is not going to happen. Although they probably will, they'll they'll probably get some ta- some taxes through on on wealthy people, maybe barely, maybe before before the next uh, uh, congressional election. But um, it won't, yeah, it won't be nearly enough. I mean, and thank God. I mean, I don't want them to have any money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm glad and. <laughs> And you know, I don't want my money to go to bombs, and you have no right to take it from me. So that's that's. Are you one of those sovereign citizens that are you going to go to court saying that uh, that federal taxes are illegal? Because those like like because th- those ne- those never get thrown out of court. Like Peter Schiff's <laughs> like Peter Schiff's dad died in prison. That's how he died as a tax protester. Um, People still do. <laughs> I, I don't think it's that funny, honestly. I think it's pretty awful, <laughs> and he's right. No, it's just a philosophical principle that uh, you know be, just because six out of ten people say. Uh, they could take my neighbor's money. Doesn't make that morally right. Uh, their their political authority is an illusion, um, and um, and it's and it's morally wrong if you just think about it for a couple seconds. Now, can you give me an example of why? Yes, you should take my neighbor's money. Maybe, probably, but we do. St- I mean, we do so much shit. If you work for the state, we do so much more shit that you would never, never take my neighbor's num- money for. Like, like, but isn't uh, but isn't the problem then not the taking of the money, but the use of the money? Well, no, the taking you can't you're not you you wouldn't take someone's money, Jordan. You walk down the street. That's not how you behave. You 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 behave it's taxes for the better the better good of society that we do good <laughs> things with to help everyone. Well, I mean, that's what it's supposed it's, to be. And if they don't <laughs> use it to help everyone, solve that pro. To me, it's not the taking of the like. If if no, but, if they use well, the money for good purposes, then you wouldn't mind it. Well, it, it 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 does it does matter because if the person you're taking the money from doesn't disagree, then it's immoral. You're stealing. Who wants their money taken? No one wants their money taken. Well, then you're a thief. <laughs> yeah, but that's the price of paying. That's the price. That's the price there of are, the, the fire department like coming and the police examples. and my education. There are some like philosophical examples, like 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 let's say. You're walking down the street with her grandma. <clears throat> a pizza guy is delivering a pizza. She passes out. <laughs> is, do you have the right to steal his car? <laughs> We're not talking about that, though. That's yeah, but, not, well, that's what that's. That is, is the what is, is the is the car going to supply a K through twelve well, education for my well, children? Jordan, no. Th- this is this is the reason why it's easy to be a liberal, as I was, is because once you just overlook some of these simple philosophical principles and laugh them off. Right. And don't take them seriously. Of course, you could take people's money. Like, but you're the bad guy. I'm trying to help people here. Look at me, Jordan, just like you were doing, making fun of the woke people and the Bitcoiners. You're doing the same thing. I'm the one who wants to help people. It's for the benefit of other people. But no, but you're stealing my neighbor's money. He doesn't want to do it with you. Oh, oh, that's ridiculous. You're I'm helping. You're not. Right. So once you pass that, once you just throw away that philosophical principle, of course, which is why it's never asked. And, and like yeah, you, but, but 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 hold on. Is so you tell that so you tell your neighbor. We, we can't say it's you. We have to say that it's your neighbor. You can uh, say me too. Yeah, but so 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 if you're not going to pay taxes, that means like how are you going to get how are you how are you getting anywhere? You obviously the, can't. You can't walk you, on but, a road exactly. But you can't throw away the first principles. You can't just throw them away and laugh them off. They're real. That's so. What so, so what what would your solution be to that? That's you're the one. You're the one taking the money. You tell me. What do you mean? Why do I have to tell you? You're, why do I? You're take, trying to take my shit. Because we need to build roads. We need. Okay. To, how do you get you your plumbing neighbor, to your house? You stick a gun in my neighbor's face to build your road. 
That's what taxes are. Yes. Would you do that? Do they? Or, what do they or need? Would you, or would you maybe try to find another solution? What like would the make, other make solution? Walmart be? pay to the for the road to, between them and Costco. Yeah, but you're, if you're taxing Walmart, you're taxing people also. You're stealing I mean, their you money. Tax them either. <laughs> how does any? How does anything get done then? That that's your fucking problem. You're the thief. You tell me. No, but you're the one using. You're the one using services from from people that did pay. That it it, it doesn't. It, it is it morally justified. First, we got to answer that question. Now here. Now maybe roads are. You have to stick a gun in my neighbor's face. Maybe. But that's not how we look at it. That's not how we look at this shit, right? We just laugh it off and go, oh, the rich people are the bad guys. They're not giving enough money. You're, what do you mean that you're stealing? You're not stealing. It's for the benefit of mankind. It's like, no, c- c- give me a break. It's, it's super simplified, skipping over important steps of how we should organize ourselves. And it causes so many so many problems like taxes, like income tax too. Like there's other ways to tax. There was no, no I tax. agree with you. I, there was no federal tax. There was no federal tax until like 1913, right? How did they run? How did they run their lot? How did the federal government run it all? Oh, wait, maybe there's other ways we can get money for these services, right? Maybe there's other things. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> Not you, Jordan, just like people in general who like would just glance over the non-aggression principle and just laugh it off. Have you ever even worked for the state? No, you probably don't know shit. You don't know what's going on there. You don't know your local state senator, your still state state rep. You don't know what bills are being passed on there. You have no clue for sure what the bureaucrats are doing, like me, when I was working there. And actually, that matters. Like, we have a lot of influence. We're the ones to decide how these laws get in place. You have no absolutely no But to me, that's the broken – to me, Brian – I'm I'm on board with you on that. To me, that's the broken part. To me, that's the like I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, because I I follow politics and I follow it at the local level. And like you see some of these, you, even the most well intentioned bills that are like being par- paraded. You read through them and you go, like, dude, this is gonna like what ended up like. I mean, we talk about like the Patriot Act. Yeah. Like it's like oh we're gonna send it's like you read through that and it's like dude you know what's gonna end up happening they're gonna spy on everyone now like like at the local level that even happens with like water water like they give contracts to certain people and it's like you know what's gonna end up happening five years from now this, this the utility company is gonna raise the price and they're not gonna be able to change this and now that's gonna be now people are gonna complain and 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 it's all because of fucking lobbyists and people getting their hands into all this shit and most of them don't even know what the fuck they're talking about yeah. I to- totally agree. But uh, also, too, there's two there's two two subsets here. One's political philosophy, right? This is like, is it morally right? What should we do? We got to ask like questions. When would when would something be right or wrong? And then there's the in practice real world we're living in, which is exactly what you're talking about. These are two totally separate things. And this is why everyone's brainwashed as I used to be, because I could have a conversation with a liberal and about. Um, living in the matrix or whether we live in a simulation or all these other things like that. And they will go, they will talk to you for hours about it. Right. And then I'll say like, you know what? You shouldn't take my neighbor's uh, money to pay for roads and they fucking will lose their shit. Right. And it's like, we just had a conversation where everyone, you know, everything you love, everything that's important to you is fake. Doesn't exist at all. And you are happy to talk about it. But if you go like, you know, maybe you have no right telling a a bookstore in Nevada uh, that they should pay their employees $15 an hour because you don't know shit about bookstores or books or what their situation is. And be like, whoa, 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 living wage, Uh, uh, uh," right? Like they'll they'll get so, so offended. Yeah, but I come come from that – but I come from the moral philosophy just like you from the other end of the spectrum of do you believe – that we have a moral imperative for the 330 million people that live in the United States that they should they should they should have a right to health care and education. Should they have a right to clothe and food and shelter? Like not I'm not talking about like the bare minimum, but in relation to our GDP, that everyone should have a uniform standard of living we could disagree on what that standard of living is but do you do we have a moral philosophy that 
that even if you're the dumbest person, that you had five kids for no pet, like because you didn't, you didn't, you know, you're horrible people, but that you're a human being and a United States citizen, that you have the right. I may not be a constitutional right currently, yeah. but do you have a right to all of this? And if you believe morally that 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 then. How do we solve? Then, then we get to well, you, how you, does that? Uh, but you're, you're conflating. You're conflating two things because you are making it political. Like you're making it because you're talking about the USA. So in a moral philosophical uh, discussion, how about the world? It's, then it's then the, whole world. the whole world. Okay, so do you do you have a responsibility to pay for some poor person in Africa? Like, should they take your money and give it to someone from Africa? I I believe that we that as human beings we have the moral right? imperative because you are super rich compared to everyone else on the planet right. like the average way. So like you would have to give away probably 90% of your money. Not give away, let me excuse like excuse me, taken from you without your consent. If that makes everyone if every human being yeah, that would make everyone probably better off, but actually what it would do is ruin the world, of course, <laughs> because why would you work why would you produce? Well, then, see now, now you're now you're getting into the conservative money. brainwash. Of course, stuff. of course, you wouldn't do that. Yeah, but now, see, see, you're, the stuff that you're making fun of me, you're now talking about. Well, you wouldn't work. There are plenty of people that work okay. even when they don't want to work. That they, okay, they want to do but, something. Okay, but now, okay, so now, now you still have to answer the question of, and so you're talking about the Ra like the, the the Raoul's veil of ignorance, basically, which is the the, the main liberal philosophical argument for that for that side. Okay, but okay, what what about the people who don't want to do that? They don't want to give away. X amount of money. And first of all, by the way, you're discounting that if there were no borders and they had to take the wealth of America and give it to Brazil and all the poor South African and, and, and the, 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 um, the, the suburbs of China, you think no one would, no one would think that's morally acceptable. No, I, in, in practice, no, I, I'm, I'm willing to admit that it would negatively affect me. And from a personal level, I'd rather them not do it. But from a, yeah. a moral, <laughs> objective level, I would yeah. agree with it. Well, okay. I don't okay. have to be that, moral. That is, See, that is the, the thing is, I Brian, I don't have to be moral. No, no, no but I, I I think that is true. But you're, 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 you're granting, you're granting things that, that are, uh, 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 way off base that the world would still ex work. As I know, I know. It, it, we, things we'd be would throwing be so stuff off to the point of they stupidity. are. Yes, that there would be, you know, riots in the streets. I know. You know, just like it would be a disaster. Like honestly, that would kill more people than just keeping it status quo. That would kill. You would kill uh, probably hundreds of millions of people. Maybe they you might maybe ruin the entire to. economy of the world. Maybe we need to. Supply. Maybe maybe that'll fix everything. Maybe we need to. <laughs> But there, it still you see how many people there are in this world. It still doesn't. It still doesn't mean. It still doesn't mean that uh, you you have a moral right to take your neighbor's money. It, it doesn't. If he disagrees with you, you still don't. I, I, I could I could agree with that I, from a more from a moral perspective. But yeah. I'm not okay. viewing this from a moral. And one, once we pass, once we just throw that aside, of course everyone's a liberal then. What you'd be a monster not to be. Right, and that's how I used to think. Honestly, is I, 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 not even that long ago, 2014, I almost got in a fight at a wedding <laughs> over the minimum wage. I'm not even kidding, and I was pro minimum wage, and the other guy wasn't. And like, and like my 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 ex and his wife pulled us apart, and I'm like, whatever. People are looking at me. I'm like, what is wrong with me? But yeah, yeah. But no, but would it, you agree can, to, to to kind of wrap up? The subject that yeah. the stuff that you're arguing about is is the method, but the result we're we're still aiming for the, a similar result. So it's not a matter of like we. It's not like you're saying I don't want roads. I don't want call. I don't want education. I don't want police departments. I don't want. I don't want uh, the common good. The common utilities like the plumbing into your house. Like you're not going to build your own electrical uh, the transformers in order like. That, but you're ju you just you want it to be accomplished in a way that it doesn't involve stealing your neighbor's money. Well, yeah, well, I mean, at least that should be the first question you should ask. But also, one of the one of the hardest things to find out, figure out, is the unseen consequences from central planning. So, like, let's say you tried to centrally plan in like 1987 or something, right? You had no knowledge that the Soviet Union was going to fall a few years later. You had no knowledge that this thing called the internet was going to come and change the world, right? And so you take all this money for good, right? You're trying to do good, 
and you change the world. You change the rest of the, you, you have no idea what's to come, right? It's impossible to centrally plan. So what would happen? Like maybe the internet doesn't get invented. Maybe, you know, you know, uh, maybe we spend hundreds of millions, billions of dollars on uh, planes we don't need. Right. And uh, armies that we don't need. And then what do we have to do? Use these armies eventually. Right. Like you have no idea what what problems you can cause uh, by guessing like this is um, there, there. And there's there's plenty of uh, like Mises social cal calculation essays, a short one people can read on why uh, you need markets and price discovery and all sorts of things like that. Michael Humers, uh, he's a professor at uh, UC Boulder. He's one of my favorite philosoph uh, philosophy professors. Professors, he has a uh, problem with political authorities. Another good one. People want to check that out. This is not about DFS. All of a sudden, <laughs> like 15 <laughs> minutes. I didn't know we were gonna, we were going to talk about this. But do do I have to? Do I have to? Is it morally justifiable for me to? Is it? Hey, is it morally justifiable for the DFS sites to take rake? Yeah, because it's a voluntary interaction. But there. But in in order. But the only way for us to have a living is buy on these sites and they're, they're morally, I'm, I'm trying, no, I'm trying yeah, to, I'm no, trying to make your other argument. jobs. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to weave it into like, like, is this a reason what we should just, uh, we should sue DraftKings yeah. over the rake. There are no solutions. There are only, there's only trade-offs, right? So like in a, in a freer society, would there be bad things? Of course, of course there would be bad. People would be taken advantage of, right? And to Thomas Jefferson, I'd rather deal with the problems of too much Liberty than too little. So like there will be problems. It won't be a perfect society, um, but it would be a more moral society in my estimation. Like there, I understand a lot of like the Ben Burgess socialist arguments, um, but like we are so far from any anything that like anyone on the far left or the or the, the libertarian side would want, anyways. Right? Like it's so far from like you have to get a a license to cut hair, right? Like. Like why, like why, 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 what are you, why are you, there's like, um, you have to get a, a two year apprenticeship to get a Falcon, to like be a Falconeer, like under the state. Like, like, why are you, why are you like, you're taking my neighbor's money for this, right? Like if you just break it down to the easiest, okay, why are we doing this at all? When, what happened? When did this happen? Right. If, 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 if you have, if you hold a Falcon and you you've have an apprentice for for more than two years. Do you have to tell everyone that you're not you're I'm not a, fa a falconeer. I'm just a guy with a bird, <laughs> right? Not financial advice. I'm not a financial I advisor. Wonder, <laughs> I wonder if you could get arrested, like you didn't take the two year apprenticeship. Right? It, right. Are, is, is someone gonna like? We're gonna put you in a cage because you and held like, a falcon without a license. Yeah. I mean, and once you start like going down the road of like, do we need any, are these interactions with the cop and the populace necessary? Are they causing more problems than they're helping? Right. And, um, and, and, and that's why a lot of liberals can agree with libertarians. I'm not really a libertarian, but, um, uh, because like a lot of them are the same thing. A lot of the, a lot of the civil arguments are the same thing. It's, um, the solutions, the, the difference. And they're, <laughs> The, the actual of what's what's going on and how to change that that's way more complicated but like once you throw away that first you know initial fundamental principle of well is it okay to take someone's money and what when, when is it okay um of course you're a liberal like everyone who wouldn't be like you're t my, my grandma's uh, needs health care and you're stopping that right yeah but this plug this half the country it, it, they don't think in terms of that moral that moral yeah. question that you're asked. Yeah, you're this is another. Uh, this is the democracy. Here's another thing. Democracy is not equivalent to moral good. It's not synonymous. It's not the same thing. But we're raised to think it is, and it's not. It's a last resort, if anything, especially when you're using force and coercion. Right. It's the best so, form of government. Uh, it's the yeah. worst form of government. Just happens to be better than all the other forms of government. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Winston Churchill, but. Um, I would say, yeah, it's the worst form of government besides all the others. It's, and should be used exceedingly rare, if at all. So, like, if just because it's six out of ten does not make it moral, right? You could just make any example. We're at dinner. Six out of ten of us vote that you should pay for dinner. That doesn't make it any more moral. Um, <clears throat> it's only moral if it's like a um, a voluntary interaction, like a um, a condo association or something like that. Yeah, you can use democracy in those sense. 
But I mean, have you said, have you? I've been involved in condo associations. They're awful. But they're awful. <laughs> they're horrible. <laughs> That's right? not moral. And, and the funny thing is, people have this Gelman amnesia effect. I like to say when it comes to politics, is they'll be like, "Oh my God, democracy is so horrible." But it's like, but we got to bring democracy to the Middle East, right? <laughs> and this is why when when we're when we're raised, you know, in government schools or socialized by people who went to government schools, there's no way around it to think that government is uh, that the democracies synonymous with moral good, they can use it to invade these countries. It's like, oh, weapons of mass destruction. Oh, it turns out there isn't any. Yeah, but we got to bring up democracy. Don't forget democracy, right? It's like, oh, this election thing happened. Well, it's for democracy. It's got to be about democracy. Democracy's great. It's like, democracy's not great. Democracy's a last resort. Like, you don't want to use force and coercion to begin with in any of these situations. And just because the majority says so, and you can think about this like, in so many different ways, like, like minority, uh, you know, minority people or minority uh, sexual preferences. And like how many, if, if the, if the uh, majority got to decide how many like Qurans could be printed after 2000, after nine 11, how many would be printed? Right. Like if, if like, you know, not that they had many rights, but like, if, like if, if after the uh, like AIDS crisis in the eighties, like, okay, the majority decides on like whether gays should be allowed to do X, Y, or Z. And during that panic, like of some, course they some of those against. some of those laws are still on the books. Well, and th th there's another thing too. Like this is just democracy in general. It's like most of these laws were voted on by people before you were born and are long dead. Like this, this isn't a democracy. It is not a democracy anyways. It's a representative republic, which is two different things. You don't actually vote on it. And and by the way, these people are very average. I know a lot of them. They're not like special people. It's com completely they're, they're mostly they're mostly less than special people. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah. Speaking of medians and averages. Right. Um, yeah. And then once it, once the bureaucracy gets involved and, and there's all in and, and the economic principles of incentive consequences and time preference are all backwards and wrong when you do when you do it this this way through democracy. It may, they, they, their incentives are perverse, like they get money from lobbyists they are trying to get reelected. It's not their money. They don't give a shit. Right. And then if they fuck up. There's no consequences. In fact, a lot of times you you can like vote for a war. Hundreds of thousands of people can die. Right. You can admit you were wrong and then you get elected president <laughs> like you get rewarded <laughs> for such things. You know, and this and both parties do this like they're 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 no better. And, and, if, and their time preferences are off. Like if you did have kids, for example, you'd want the world to be better off for them. But like a politician has a high time preference. They're going to be out of there in two, four years. They don't, you know, they, they don't have a reason to. And they're looking at their next job. A lot of times they're looking, they're looking they're going to become the lobbyist. Yeah. Well, you get, would you vote for the Raytheon bill or uh, would you vote against them? You know, you're going to be out of there in a couple of years anyways. Of course you're going to vote for it. Like it's, it's, they're, they're acting in their rational self-interest too. Like, um, um, so like there's just, and this is the practical side now we're talking about like what actually occurs out there. It's. It's just, it's just awful. Like, like you would never stick your gun in my neighbor's face for 95% of the shit that went on Springfield. I guarantee it. And you only have to work there for like six months and then you're like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Were, I you, were, you, there, were you there during Blagojevich? No. No, no. I was under Quinn. Uh, Governor Quinn was my boss. And, uh, and then I left him and went – to the treasurer's office after Rauner, the Republican won. So like when, when, when the, when the parties change, like they just fire everybody. Right. So yeah, it's <laughs> like, Oh, that's a winning system. Right. <laughs> and so like, so when Quinn was running, he got like $10 million from the unions of his like 50 million, some large portion from the unions. And I had to campaign for him voluntold kind of like when you work for work for him. And, um, and so he lost to Rauner, who hated the unions. And it's like, okay, you can't win here because if Quinn won, he's embedded to the unions because he got all his money for him. And then when he loses, now you got a guy in there who hates the unions. So what do you think is going to happen there? There was no budget for like three of his four years of his term. They didn't even do a budget. They didn't even come to an agreement because because the, the unions fucking hate him and he hates them. So it's like there's like no winning, especially with the polarization too. It's like just getting worse and worse. Well, we see the polarization in DFS, right? The 150 well, maxers. Uh, we got to, 
The 150 Maxers versus the, the, the single bullet guys, right? That's just the Pareto principle. <laughs> the 20% of people do make 80% of the outcomes. It's going to happen whenever you let people go, like even in prisons, like the most regulated environment. Some guys have more cigarettes than other guys, right? Like some guys do better in the prison system. And it's all legal. They get drugs. They get weapons. They get all sorts of things in there. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Right. But when you get elected, uh, you didn't go there to say sometimes there's nothing you can do. Like, some, you people do. some people do. You came there to help. No, no one says that. there's plenty there's, of Democrats that say that sometimes. Who Democrats that look at what's going on now. It's like, oh, we're, we're for all these ideas that have no chance of passing. So you oh, yeah. vote for us, even though like the like, no, the, 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 the cinema, mansion, Testa, like, like they're, they're like. That to me, that's to me, that's why I hate the Democrats sometimes even more. And I am on the liberal side because it's like, like, dude, either come up with solutions or like, don't say that you're for something that you know, like, you'll never be called on it because it'll never be enacted. And now people hate you for the fact that nothing gets like Democrat, like the left hates the right because the right does stuff that the left disagrees with. The left hates the left, the middle, the centrists. Because they say that they're on the left, but really they don't do anything. So like, to me, like that's, that's the not, that's the, the lose, lose scenario. Mm. Like to me, it, it feels like I almost have more respect for the right because I don't agree with nearly anything that they do, but at least they do it. I mean, at least they, like, like you run on something and you go, okay, you're going to try to repeal, repeal Obamacare 74,000 times. You said you were going to do it. So like. Like, at least you're doing it. Yo, you gave tax cuts to the richest people. Well, you said you were going to do that. I mean, how, how could yeah. I not? Oh, that's what you said you're going to do. Okay. Democrats, think, it seems like they never do what they say they're going to do. I I mean, uh, Jeff Dice from Mises Institute says a line. He goes, the, the Democrats mean what they say and Republicans don't. And I, I tend to agree with that. And I think the course of history in America, anyways, for the last 125, 150 years is definitely progressive. Yeah, Definitely course. progressive. There was, like I said, there wasn't even a federal tax in ni- before 1913. So, like, they're incrementally destroying the Republican. There is no de- Republican Party anymore. Like, there's not even a Republican. What is the Republican? It's not the neocons anymore. It's not. It's like, I, who, who's in charge? Like, you can't even tell. Who? No one knows what they're even going to do. Are they going to go the, the populist route? Are they going to go back to the the Bush the legacy route, uh, the neocon route, like they don't really have anything. The, I would say the, the Democrats over time have just annihilated the Republicans. It just we have to deal with every couple of years having to, having to. I mean, I mean, it's just it's just it's weird to me. I know, I know, I know. This is a DFS podcast. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just that, delete this last thirty minutes out? <laughs> no, because people you do this for Lulz also. Lulz is a, it's a podcast okay. it's and then show. it ends up turning into whatever the fuck it is. But like, I never thought I'd see a day like in the in the past whatever years that Paul Ryan is like, oh, he's too centrist for the Republican bar. <laughs> but like, really, policy? It just, I think, I think what you mean is like the Republicans like have they have no policies. Like, like whatever I, conservative I think, policies like are just like, like what 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 do you stand for? Yeah, I think like the idea that Paul Ryan is too centrist for um, uh, the the Republican Party now is just pure bullshit because. Like they don't they don't think of centrist as an economic argument. They think of it as a cultural argument. Now. Right, right. That's exactly. But that but that's but it, it's only been like that since like maybe the late seventies. I mean, really, that kind of like the religious right. Like the Republican Party before that was more based around economic and civil pr- principles than cultural. Every administration, including Reagan the size and scope of government has increased. It's all bullshit. They, every single time, they've all spent more money and grown the size of government, even under Reagan, if you look at the size, right. if you look at the numbers. And Reagan was the big you know, cutter in chief or whatever they used to call him. Um, the liberals won. They just, they, they don't know it. <laughs> so why aren't you on the winning side then? Um, I was on the winning side. Well, why'd you leave the winning side? Um, 
when when Trump when Trump won was when I when I first started thinking about this type of stuff because I was like legit I, I don't know if you remember I was like I was like it's a, and just shameful to admit I was like legitimately scared the night he won I was like oh my god I just started drinking I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna start drinking I'm like like maybe he's gonna nuke China who knows what this fucking guy's gonna do. And it and the stock market crashed that day. I don't know if people remember. It went down like two, three hundred points. I'm like, the stock market's going to crash. Everyone's going. We're going to go right back into the recession. And uh, <clears throat> maybe a week later, I snapped out of it. And I was like, okay, okay, maybe you're maybe you're being a little dramatic here. But I, I've had to stop. It's like, okay, I was a Bernie bro. So it's like, thank God Bernie didn't win. And then Trump wins four years later, or another Trump wins. The type wins eight years later. And I don't think about Trump like this now as I did then. But because, like, let's say Bernie wins and gets all his policies enacted, which he wouldn't, but let's right. just say he did. Well, now Trump has access to this monster of uh, government that has, you know, uh, health care is like, what, two-fifths of the economy, um, the military, like, like the, the size, if, if everything Bernie wanted would have been enormous power that this madman, you know, that's what I thought of him back then, would have control of. And I was like, maybe, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe the direction, you know, the country, the country's polarizing. You know, like I was saying this not that long ago, like you would think Trump's bad. You might get somebody worse. And like, do you really want him to have this? And then from President that Hawley, little, it's coming, right? President Hawley <laughs> from, from that little kernel. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know a ton about him, honestly, but um, from that little kernel, I mean, I, I didn't vote last time and I'm probably never going to vote again, but from that little kernel, <laughs> Um, I did start going down, down these roads of, you know, I would, usually like a good, uh, uh, like Milton Freeman's like a decent introduction. Capitalism Freeman, his first book, freedom, his first book, like the first 50 pages is like a decent synopsis and they have all these YouTube videos and Thomas Sowell. And then, but there's like so many good ones like Murray Rothbard, uh, Mises, you know, Hayek is the road to serfdom. Everyone talks about all the time. And I really like like the philosophers like Jason Brennan at Duke and uh, Michael Humer, like I've mentioned at UC Boulder. And it's all it's all just logic based, honestly. And then and then from there, like the problem is like you have discussions like this with other. I'm in Chicago, so it's all liberals all the time, right? And so you have these discussions. You're like, okay, well, how do I defend these? How do I defend? And, and honestly, we haven't even really gotten into it that much. But like people are probably like these people are crazy. It's like no, it goes way deeper than any of these levels. And then so then you have to start getting in the economics of it. And I think it's actually kind of helped my DFS in some ways, like just how? studying. How how is that, how is this help your DFS? Well, because you like you could think in like my my ownership uh video, my first ownership video is kind of just like a simple economic principle. You know, of like what happens when you do this to that. Um and these are how economists think. Like, okay, pose an analogy, you know, and then like try to solve that that issue. And so the analogy was, you know, if you were in a classroom and you voted on heads or tails, but you got a tip from the teacher's aide on what the other kids in the class are doing, how would you answer, uh, how would you adjust for this information, right? And so you read economic books. It's not going to tell you how to do any of that stuff or apply to DFS, but it will get you thinking a little more like an economist as opposed to just like, you know, uh, living wage and, 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 and like just sayings, like emotional sayings, which of course no one could disagree with, especially if you have no philosophical, uh, uh, fundamentals, you know, I mean, at least from, from my perspective, because let's be honest, most people aren't thinking about Rawls veil of ignorance. <laughs> most when they people, think, when they, you could have stopped that sentence, like people. after the word thinking, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Most right. people aren't thinking just that's it. <laughs> yeah. But, but there, there's another argument against democracy. I love when people go, usually what happens in these discussions, it gets to the point where the person says, I don't trust people to do what you want. Like that they will act that they won't get evil and hurt people. I don't trust humans. Right. Like to, to, to be, a, and I'm like, okay, this isn't my line. But it's like, okay, what species would you like to run the government then? Right. <laughs> but I don't trust like, people either. But I, I, I agree with that. 
Most yeah, so people then what are species, horrible. So then why give them this gigantic apparatus of the state? You because know what it's, I mean? It, it, it's the worst. It's the same thing. It's it's the best, worst thing that someone has to do. All right, what and, species are we going to give it? Let's give it to the kangaroos. And they really aren't thinking, too. So, like, the like the, the woke the woke stuff, it's like, hey, look, first of all, I am for defund the police for different reasons. But um, uh, I think you get better customer service from private companies than you do um, any government agency, especially Is ones that I Is that what you consider for. police officers be customer service? Of course, yeah. They should be. They, all they should do is pr- protect your private, your body and, and private property should be their main objective, right? It shouldn't be giving tickets out to people. Um, but, uh, and also, the, the, like we said, incentives, consequences, all these other economic issues are, are the problems for it. But I mean, I, but my, my point being about, about like not thinking things through, it's like, okay, well, then how come I don't see people in the streets about these fucking wars, right? Okay. That we, we I think like we're almost at like 900,000 over a million casualties, innocent women, men and children dead in all these five wars in the Middle East. They're all brown people. They're all people of color, poor, poor as shit. These are the innocent people, not the soldiers who they shouldn't have died either. Um, no one, not a fucking peep. Like what sense does that make? You know, maybe you're just not listening hard enough. Listening, listening hard. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You're watching yeah. the MS- MSM. You're watching the mainstream media. You have to. I, don't, no, I wh- think that is a big problem with the brain, with the with the <laughs> with the with the brain disease of of um, of the state. Like I think the state is a religion, and Democrats and Republicans are like Protestants and Catholics, right? And democracy is the god, and um, and they're just fighting over the same shit. Like that Chomsky quote of. Um, uh, there's no there's no other way to keep like a a, a people pacified um, than allowing them vigorous debate in a narrow range of topics. Right. And so you just argue over this this shit that doesn't matter while they're just printing your money, taking your money, is, bombing is, people. Isn't that a good pr- to try? I'm, I, you, I, this is my fifth attempt to try to get back to DFS. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gone back thirty minutes ago. Uh, don't don't you think that that's uh what a lot, what DFS content a lot is of a lot of argument over a narrow range of topics. Most of it not mattering. I, I never thought of that. That's I, that's probably dead on. Yeah. People arguing over the spin rates of two fastballs or, you know, the, the 21% target share, but this, you know, he runs a five, you know, five, he's, he's a good, it comes from this, like those types of things. Core wide receiver cornerback matchups where if you did the scientific process, you'd see that those things, they may matter. They may not matter. They, if they do matter, they matter so little yet. Like that's what's talked about. Like, oh, he's, he's going to be shut down by, you know, by Janoris Jenkins or whoever, Jalen Ramsey shadow, whatever. And then you see in like the math, like, like, no, it's like, like you just you spent six hours arguing over something that, like, but as long as we keep it to that narrow range, guys like uh, guys like you get to take all the money. Um, back to politics. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, I say this. This this reminds me too. I say this all the time on the podcast. It's like, uh, people think they have a lot more control over this than they do. Like, you have no control whether you take seventh or first or second or thirteenth. And it's like maybe even like, I don't even know, 25th or even lower. It's like, especially in baseball, like that one bomb at, you know, 1130 at night when you're going to sleep or something you don't see and you look on your phone and it either goes against your euphoria. Like, you don't know, you know, but those those 14 points sure matter, you know, for the for the payout of that day. So, like, yeah, they're 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 arguing. Because they're. Over, over things that have no consequence a lot of times because you can't you can't control it. But doesn't that come back to the the to, to bookend from the beginning that people mistake variance with luck and then then it gets to the the mindset of how could this game be a game of skill? And is is and and what I say I don't know if you would agree with this the be, this that this is the better analogy is that we both come from poker. 
that in one hand of poker, one hand of poker is luck. A hundred thousand hands of poker is skill. Right. So is isn't isn't the the right mindset that when people are like, oh, it was lucky that you won on this one slate. The answer should be yes, but it's not lucky that I've been a profitable player for eight years. Right? I think, I think without a doubt. And, you know, there is a little difference in poker. Like there's dead money in DFS. Like people there's forget dead to money do their in lineups. Poker. There's dead money in poker. There's that. There's de- obviously there's dead money in poker, but not nearly as much. Like in MMA, like three or four weeks ago, there was like ten thousand dead lineups. I mean, like people didn't submit. Like ten thousand. I don't this know. This doesn't if include. This doesn't include the two fighters that got the fifty-five percent of ownership. No, no, that just no, went out no. the door. This was a, this was probably like three weeks ago, where like you know how you could reserve a spot and just not it. So like maybe they had a promotion where they gave away a lot of entries or something. But like, I mean, that's that's an uncommon occurrence. Maybe, but yeah, I, I think I know the reason. Maybe RBX eighty eight was having sex with a lot of people. It was all <laughs> RBX eighty eight. He's <laughs> responsible for all the dead money you're gonna find. <laughs> uh, so Brian Lulls yeah. is on. You, you don't do a very good job at promoting your YouTube channel or no. or podcast. Pete does a much better job for you. Yeah, all that type of stuff. But you have. On your YouTube channel, from I mean, you, you've you've d- not done as many of them in the past year, but you have a bunch of like tutorial walk through like ten minute things that I mean, essentially it's I mean, what you talk about and what I talk about are not anything different. We may have different approaches of how to explain it, but like learning those types of game theory concepts and bankroll and stuff like your your 10 minute videos on your channel or like that to, to good players we'd rather people not watch them but i i think they're i think their view counts are are very much lower than they should be yeah i'm not i'm not good at promoting and plus you're like supposed to put tags in there and stuff and uh but i don't know um i might I'm, I think you want start... people to get better. I want. I want. I want to end on this because we've been. I. I. I have the theory of daily fantasy sports. I here's here's general game theory. Whatever you you're you're teaching people somewhat right mm-hmm. on lulls. You're coming out with the sports betting kind of app, uh, but you also you've also had a discussion on lulls about like do you want do you want to give the edge away. Yeah. Like that, that whole, so do you view, like, do you think it's, because the attitude that I have, it's, it's come, I think it, it go again, getting back to politics, most, uh-huh. that most, like most people don't think, like, I, I remember in poker that during the boom, everyone started playing poker and there's so many books. I read all the two plus two books. I read, I mean, I, all of that stuff, the two plus two forums, then pocket fives, and then uh, run it for, then all these new, then I started getting out of poker once the HUDs came in and whatever. Uh, even with all that, I could go to my local card room and like seven out of the 10 players at the table, like obviously like have never like, like, dude, I'm going to make money because like, that, or they have these fucked up notions of like, you know, like, I'm going to, no limit. I'm going to raise 30 and I won two tables because I want to protect my aces, you know, like, like bullshit type of shit. Yeah. Like where they know enough, but still not enough. So, but all the, well, the material's out there. Like all, like, right. dude, if you want to get better, you can get better. And then you have the people that re, I, I knew plenty of people that I played with in New York city in underground rooms that were pretty bad players that, and they were smart people. Like they, I, I, like they were intelligent people. They were on Wall Street. They were a doctor or whatever. And they're like, oh, I want to get better at poker. And I'm like, well, this is how you get better at poker. But they're using poker as a recreation. So it's like the whole point of it is they want to gamble. So it's like, well, you're never going to become a good poker player if you want to gamble. You want to be – this is not, this, this is not. oh, you just got off your shift and this is how you blow off some steam. You have to play seriously. And it's like, here's all the book. And, it's like, and they say they want to get better. And they're like, oh, I'll buy this $40 book. And they read it and they understand it. And then they get to the table and it's like someone raised and I have five, six suited. And like, 
fuck it, anything could happen on the flop. It's like, to me, that's 95% of the DFS audience as it is. So what's the, someone is coming out with the theory of poker. Someone's coming out with the right. super system. So it's not like it's like no one, all, all the good players are going to never share their secrets. It's like the material does come out. I mean, look at the tools that are out now versus 2013. Like it's yeah. going to happen. Why can't it be me? And why, and knowing that 95% of people that even buy it, aren't going to implement it properly, aren't going to be in my contest. And I'm, I still, I'm, when I'm still going to be better than the player that just got into it now, because I had now a four year head start. So now I improve my processes. So like, where does the attitude come in? I know you mentioned it on your podcast. And I think, I, I don't know if you could expand just a little on it, that are you at the level that you're at? Like we're talking from different, like I'm not playing a lot of the contests that you're playing, mm -hmm. but when you're playing the high stakes stuff, one new good high stakes player really affects you. Yet for me, yeah. if I'm, if I'm playing at lower or mid stakes, that there's, there's going to be enough, you know, of the field that one or two really good players that really learn this stuff doesn't affect me that much. And is that what, is that what, that what you're that, more concerned about. That's what I was just going to say. Yep. Is uh, the thing I was mainly concerned about is making a monster. I don't want to make. So like, I'm trying to think of like two of the young gun now guys is like, um, B Kreider. Like, I guess he's been around a while now. Yeah. He's been around a while. Rin, Rin pack's been crushing too. How about, how about the, do you, how, what do you think of the whistles guy? The whistle goes, well, I am. I've been I, trying I, to I study his stuff. I've been trying. I, I thought when I saw that interview that, that he's an idiot. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. But well, you also thought uh, <laughs> RBX 88 is an idiot, right? This is the point of the podcast where we could just talk shit about everyone because no one's going to be going this far, especially after that political part. Yeah. Um, the, I would assume Whistle Goes Woo is not good. I need to dive in and look at his lamps because he's playing everything. And he and he had another nice run after he won that million. He won some hundred thousands here and there. At and least. he's playing multiple sports. And playing multiple sports, but like he didn't play before, right? Am I right? Right. That's what. But that's the point. Like, like, like you, you know what I do with like results DB. Like that's how I learn how to play. Like I, I studied your lineups in NBA, you know, four years ago. I mean, like I was downloading CSVs because how else right. am I going to learn how to play? So like when you sit with the whistles go woo guys, like, like dude, I, I know all the one hundred and fifty maxers. I know who I'm looking at, and then. Yeah. Once this guy won, it's like now I'm seeing him. I like I never saw him before. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, back in the poker days, they the guys did come and go. Guys did come and go, right? Online, like this guy won a million dollars this year, and it's like, what happened to him next year? So, um, you know, no offense to this whistle goes with me. I'm not. I, I'm undecided yet. I gotta. I gotta take a take a further peek, probably just for content purposes alone. I got to look at his, look at his stuff, but yeah, he's, he's playing it. And from what I can tell, he's crushing it too. I don't like keep track of other people's, you know, data or anything like that. So who knows what he's doing, but he's playing all the high stakes in all the sports and his name keeps popping up the leaderboard. Um, if he didn't do that drunken interview, who knows, you know, um, Maybe he is good, but like, but back to your, but, but back to like, actually, should we be doing content? Like, first of all, uh, the theory of DFS, great idea, great marketing idea. And like, I'm just picturing when you were coming out that like, I bet he was like, I could just take Skolansky's book, go buy it <laughs> and just change it. each chapter to DFS something. And then it writes itself. It writes itself. And um, I just did an audio. So I don't even have to write anything. There you go. <laughs> But, but, but Brian, but that is what, when I got into DFS in October, 2015, started playing soccer DFS. My first thought was this is popular enough. There has to, my fit, my, how I learned how to play poker was the theory of poker. I mean, like the two plus two books. So my attitude was there has to be a theory of DFS. And the yeah. only thing that I found were the bales for smart people books. And to me, they didn't go enough into game theory. It was like, okay. Right. Like I could see that it's, I know Bales knows his shit. I mean, like I've read a lot of his articles, like, but it's just like those books are still for 2013 and 2014. They were like at the level, but like not for now. Like I want, I want the theory of Poe and then no one did it. So I just said, fuck it. I'll do it. 
Like we, you're describing he's like, like, but that's why I said you, you you don't market your shit well, and I market my shit well. Yes, right, yeah, and um, but like I, I'm I'm always only I'm only scared about creating a monster like a guy who like you said will play in the high stakes and beat my ass all the time. Like I don't want any of these young guys doing that, but like whatever. I don't think it's, I don't think it's the end of the world. But it'd probably be better just everyone keep their mouth shut, obviously, in general. But that's not going to happen. Like you said, it's an arms race. Someone's going to eventually come up with, come out with something, and come out with something else, and then, and then your your idea is done, anyways. But for me, like me personally, like I change stuff like once a week. Like I'm always tinkering, and I always like, okay, well, what what, what about this? What about this? Maybe I should adjust. Maybe my sim's completely wrong. Maybe I should do a different way, and like. Some of the videos I never did, a lot of the stuff I, I used to do, I could probably make videos on because I don't do it anymore, but I think they're too good of ideas. <laughs> I, won't, <laughs> I won't do it. I did think about writing a book just just because like it's a challenge, you know what I mean? It's just kind of um, – and then maybe I'll put them in there. Um, but like, but like the, the point, the reason I'm saying that is like, okay, hopefully I can continue to improve and come up with some cool shit. And like, you know, I got to really – you know, sizable bankroll so I could pay coders. So I don't have, not that I know how to code, but like I come up with an idea that I know specifically and I could pay a guy where, and I know other DFS players, I won't say who they are, or do the same thing. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you can't do that. You know what I mean? By watching my video, you're not going to listen to the theory of DFS. You're not going to have extra money to pay $2,000 or something for this guy or these, these, these statistical programs are expensive too. They're, they're you know, they're, basically a minimum thousand dollars you could do the free ones you can do the free ones which, which they're will, good enough they're good they're enough. good enough they will work so you don't have to follow what i'm doing um but i also this is my career and i have a llc and it's a tax write-off so for me i don't care i'll spend a little extra money and get the and they're easier like you don't have to know code or anything like that some of these free ones you kind of have to learn their syntax but the long st- like like the the moral of the, the, the story there is Hopefully I can improve to where the advice I give out like won't won't hurt me because like I was doing that shit three years ago. I'm doing something different now, guy. You know what I mean? Hopefully. But really, you're but but we're we're not teaching that. Like the concepts we're teaching, but how to apply? Like you're still talking about like the st- like the actual the data the data analysis. I think more of the fact of if we go back to 2012, for instance. Mm-hmm. And look at a lot. We take a large field GPP back then, which wasn't that large. And you take a look at the lineups. You could see a lot. I mean, you'd see a lot of horrible lineups because, like, the only people that had projections were would be someone like you. They would be like five percent of the field even has that, and everyone else is kind of guessing. And some people could guess better than others on what the best plays and who if this guy's in and that guy's out and they run you know all the data and everything. Then we get to 2016, where now we get our first optimizers, our first like so, uh, public projection basketball monster for NBA type. Oh, there's I could just go here and just pull all of this. Yeah, and then like and as long as you understand like the concept of winning DFS contests, the game theory. Yeah. Well, now I have all the data, and now now I can apply it that way. Well, now in 2021. Like everyone has access to all of that. So is it, there's still a percentage of the DFS playing public that is still at the, there's a percentage that's at the 2012 level. Yeah. There's still a percentage that's at 2016. There's still yeah. a percentage that's pre to, that is literally, here's my favorite play, uh, Joe Schmo on the couch that like doesn't even know that even these content sites even exist. It's like, this is $5 in a dream type of guys. Is it the fact that something that, your videos, my course, you know, sharper players talking about more advanced concepts that we're eliminating a lot of that, like bottom 20, like the stuff that pays the rake level where people aren't building lineups that are like totally like really low EV. Maybe like there's two things I want to say there. That scares me, honestly, because you might be right because I'm more concerned about, like I said, the, the monster guy. So like, like quick story, what, when I quit my job to play poker back in the day, um, I the the only reason I did that really is because of Taylor Cavey. 
right? So Taylor KB owns, uh, used to own Card Runners. Mm. Now he's part owner of Establish the Run. Um, when he would do like these free YouTube videos of him playing poker heads up and um, do commentary over it. Like this, this was brand new groundbreaking back then. And he would lose a pot and then reload. And I can't remember exactly what his balance was, but it would show his balance. So I paused it. He had like $40,000 in there. And so I was, a, you know, I was a riverboat limit player, you know, right. you know, a theory of poker, exact same as you, exact same strategy, exact same as you. Hold'em wasn't even that popular back then. But anyways, it was really, this is probably whatever, like 2003 or something. And I didn't think it was possible. Like all it took for me was to just see that somebody had 40 grand on, I wouldn't even put 40 grand on a site because I'd be too scared they would steal it from me. You know what I mean? I had no... No faith that Ultimate Bet. Well, it turns out right. Ultimate Bet did steal from me. Paradise Poker, even before then, right? I was on Planet Poker. Planet, Planet Poker, Poker, yes. I was I was on Planet Poker, and they robbed they robbed you too, but not by choice. Their random number generator was was predictive. It wasn't it wasn't random enough. <laughs> so everyone who was playing on there, including me, was getting robbed too. Because someone figured that out. I've been on like every poker scan online poker scandal. I got I got robbed on. Um, but anyways, th that that's like what I'm scared of is someone sees my ownership video or something, whatever, in theory of DFS, and they go, shit, maybe I should get in this, you know? And like then they just, they're just maniacs who get obsessed with something. But and isn't then that take how all... we got in? But that, that's how That's why I get... don't want to make those guys. Oh, so, so, like, so your, concern, your concern is the is the smart person from outside of the industry yeah. that because, well, I mean, we, we don't we say it all the time that like you take a look at the, I mean, I say you take a look at the top 50 on the RG leaderboard and it's of G large field GPPs. And it's like, like it's all these guys that have like backgrounds in applied mathematics and finance and poker. Like you don't just see random Joe Schmo. That's like, yeah, that like they at least have the met the mentality. So you don't want some finance dude that has yeah, super they, they day trading. Smart. Right. And then going, Oh, within the course of three months, like becomes as good as you because they already right. have the background of that. Right. And then, and yeah, and then they get the, Oh, you can put this much money on here. Oh, there's this many players. Oh, here's a little game theory. So you can use game theory. I didn't know that. Like, and it can, it doesn't have to be outside of the industry. It could just be some guy who plays, you know, the masters once a year, throws 10 bucks into the million, the masters, but he is someone who can, who gets obsessed, obsessed with things and wants to crush competitive, smart, and then gets interested, and then then their whistle goes wooing me and taking all my money <laughs> <laughs> because I made some stupid video. <laughs> yeah, but you know? but but isn't but but are, are are you overestimating? Like I take a look at like yeah, you know, I have thirteen thousand followers. Like in, in the grand scheme of DFS, I mean, we went through the period in two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen. There's a commercial on every fucking break of everything yeah. on every channel. It's like, what what is your video? gonna is gonna like are you are you yeah. too paranoid Maybe, pr probably <laughs> probably but like at least i do it though i mean like how many guys you know uh how many of these high stakes guys are doing it making videos you know what i mean so like i'm doing it more than they are except maybe except alex but he has his own company so that doesn't really count so like, like wouldn't, I'm, you, I'm, wouldn't you want to monitor like do, do you think to to get really meta on this that like the biggest, the biggest uh, critique of content sites, of touts, quote. I mean, we talk mm -hmm. about you know, not Vegas Dave, like right. that's right, a right, different right. right. Not yeah. you. See, you have his hat. You still have his hat. <laughs> I do. It's over here. I have to get up and get it. But right. yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I can hear you. Go. Uh, the big, the biggest thing about like touts is the fact that like if you were or lineup sellers or something. Like, if you were so good, why do you have to sell? Like, like I I understand that. Like, it's the same. Oh, if you were so good, why are you, why are you telling me how to be good? Because you just be good in making all the money. And, like, my attitude when it comes to the court, and I say it on the, literally on the sales page, is that, like, I still, I still think I have an edge. And from a meta standpoint, why can't I make money in two directions? Like, to, like well, you're building this sports betting Chrome extension. Yeah. Now, if it was, so, I would say to you, if it was so good, why would you be giving it to me? You would, you'd be making all the money off of it. But of course we know the landscape of sports betting with getting limited and everything. And this yeah. could be useful for someone that's betting $50 props. And if you, if you, 
you could make the money yourself betting, but you could also make the money off of other. I mean, it does. It's not a zero sum thing. That yeah. like, why not charge? This is slightly my app, slightly different. Just to be clear, so like, it's like, it's like a software program that if it helps you, uh, f- like, f- helps it to sports bet easier. I'm not giving any picks. Right, but st- but 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 what you're doing is making it so people could get to lines quicker, which means that the right. value may be gone by the time you get. I mean, okay. like yeah. there is there is a knockoff effect. I mean, there's still so, something. Yeah, you there. know, you know, you know too much about sports betting. So, like most people, <laughs> would, most people would think that sports betting is you versus the casino, right. which it kind of is. That's the cat and mouse game of not getting limited. Good luck with that. And but it really also is getting the line first. Unless you're like Rufus Peabody or somebody who's like a, a market maker, market you know maker, what I mean. Right. So like, yeah, it, it, we are in competition. That and that's totally true. And um, and you're right. Like, I could okay. So I could first of all, DFS is my main, my main income source. So like sports betting secondary, but I'm pretty good at it. I know what I'm doing. And and a lot of this stuff I'm already doing for DFS. So for me, it's no skin off my back. But like, if I wanted to. To get in the sports book, let's say I had the skills to do it, which is definitely debatable. It's not easy. Um, like I've already gotten limited at like two at two of the four Illinois sites. Um, so, and I'm not even betting that much. Right, and uh, I know I don't know what to do. Like uh, I'm starting to learn like how to hide your play a little bit more. And I, th- that's what I'm probably going to do. Actually, focus on is probably a few sports betting videos after instead of DFS ones of uh, like, cause I don't care about giving out that information. Like it's not going to affect my bottom line. Um, but like, okay. So I could get a bova. I have a bow bottom account, but you know what I mean? I could get a bookmaker. I could have someone bet for me on penny. Right. I could join a consortium. Like people have approached me like, Hey, do you want to do this or that? And it's like, well, maybe it depends on how, if I have to do very little, maybe I'll join you. But like, why, or I could just like not do any of that, and then like, hey, here's how I do it: make some videos. Here's the app I would I use on my personal betting to make my life easier. Probably make your life easier. Like no skin off my back. And we are in we're DFS mainly. It is gambling. It's all gambling, poker, DFS. They're all things, but sports betting's not really my thing too. So. But you don't. But you don't mind giving it. But. The fact of the matter is, is that, like, you don't mind making money in both directions. No, no, no. I'm pro tout, by the way. Um, like I've said this on the site. I'm sorry, I got on like an important text message really quick. Uh, okay, yeah, it's done. Um, yeah, like I think I think there's nothing wrong with being a tout. I think people should make their own decisions, right? And it's like, I don't think we should have to be required to say not financial advice. I think this is all ridiculous. And like, you should just let people uh, uh, decide for themselves. Like, hey, Blender knows what he's talking about. I'm going to try to use his strategies. Or Blender's a dummy or Brian's a dummy. And I'm not going to, I'm going to do the opposite of what they say. And that is just, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There, As long as you're not doing something like fraudulent, like Vegas Dave <laughs> or somebody like that, where you're like, like your, 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 uh, was it marketing fraud? I don't even know what the crime would be. Like, I think have at it and like fast Eddie fear. I've kind of busted his balls a little bit online, um, about that. He doesn't have a job and he says it all the time or, or, or he doesn't play. He has a job, right? His job won't let him play. I just think that's funny. It's like, Oh, I can't my job. I can't my job. But like, it's totally possible that he could bring value to your life and not play. It's totally possible that, you could bring value to their game and also play in the same contests. Um, I see, I see, I see nothing wrong with it. Just a bunch of, a bunch of people who are shaming, shame, just a different version. I'm my, my, but my attitude is just more of a caveat emptor. A what? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not pro or, I mean, it's kind of weird for me to say that, you know, yeah, I do a show on Roto grinders Monday through Friday and I'm anti-tout. I'm just more pro-consumer awareness. Like, uh, that, yeah. Be, do your due right. diligence and and whatever it is. My, me personally, I'm more inclined to uh, follow the advice of people that have money. Like, I'm 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 with Bales, right? I'm with yeah. Talib. I'm with you know 
the best the best way to figure out you know what to do is you know like uh, what stock someone likes is don't show me what's in your portfolio like that type of mentality so i lean towards that side which then makes me self aware of like like oh well i'm going to i'm going to you know i how do i do a show without playing like i get to the point where like i have to disclaim like if i'm not playing i'm playing these types of contests but not these types of contests so even if I'm giving you advice here on this is what I would do strategically, and that's why a lot of times it gets steady. People look at it. That's what that play wherever you want. Just fucking at that. Like I don't know. I don't know. You're asking me like fucking. I, I don't know. Just play wherever you want at that point because I don't know. To me, to me, it's like that. Like the '90s critic or whatever, like or 2000s critic, where they're like, two and a half men sucks." Okay, well then don't watch it. Right. <laughs> Like there's a reason Seinfeld had a hundred million viewers of their last show or whatever, you know, it's like the cream rises to the top. We want all these, all these touts out there. Right. And then the cream will rise to the top. The fraudsters will, will uh, eventually go under. You can't protect everyone. Right. Like uh, I am totally for someone making a uh, site saying, you know, like here's the scammers, here's the, you know, calling people out saying, here's, you know, here's, we track how much they make or whatever. I don't know. You know, I'm tra- If you want to be transparent there, I'm not against any of that stuff, well, but I you am, know, you know, that roto grind. Cause I mean, you know, that, that they never wanted to be the shark scope of DFS, you know, like, yeah, because, well, I mean, cause when everything is over, I mean, with shark scope for poker, I mean, like, you know, who sucks, right? I mean, yeah. like, well, they also, they don't want everyone to see that like, oh, 95% of the people are in the red. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Because <laughs> then people will stop using rotor grinders. It's like, oh shit, so no one can win here. It's like. Right, but but same for the DF, but same for DK and fan. I mean, same for, DK is forced to put the, you know, the average results, whatever, screen in there, like whatever. But I mean, look at all their, like, you've won Seventy-one dollars. Like, no, no, I lost a thousand and twenty dollars. I didn't win seventy-one. You get the oh, you're you you collect your winnings in your email. Like they they're trying to reinforce the fact the fact that you could hide your your amount entered, right? Like it's yeah. all geared around taking away the fact that you're losing because they know yeah. that most people lose. Yeah, I mean, so how how do I feel about that? I mean, I still. Like, okay, does it suck for the newbie guy who comes in? He, lo- I don't want to call anyone out, but you could probably think of the per- person in your head. And they look like, oh, he won $18,000 with a hidden entry fee. But I'm a noob, so I don't know he's hiding his entry fee. And this is kind of the thing he does. I'm going to I'm gonna subscribe to his site. Like, I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, because I'm big on like value is subjective, right? And I've said this a million times. Like, if you want to buy a $500 golf shirt, I think you're an idiot and that costs $12 to make, but more power to you. $500 gift of that golf shirt. You're a smart investor. If you want to spend $35,000 on a Chris Bosch NFT, like I did, like a dummy, (laughs) (laughs) that's my fault and my problem. And, uh, no one else's, you know what I mean? Like, I I just find it hard to find the crime here. You know what I mean? Like, obviously it's not a crime, but like the moral in, you know, the morally questionable aspects of it. But I'm not talking about the morals. Like I'm, I'm, I'm fine with people hustling and I'm fine. I'm, I'm even fine with what Vegas Dave does. Me too. Like, like if you're dumb, like if my attitude is, is that if you're dumb enough to think that someone goes a hundred and Oh, in a week of bets, Like you're, you, you should be, you, the, the money, the, that, that money should be leaving your hands. Cause you're not, you shouldn't be smart enough to have it. But, but, but the thing he that might, he, the, just really quick, really quick, he might be doing some, like, who knows what he's doing behind the scenes. So like, if he's doing some sort of hedging, you know, a uh, scam where he gives half his users right. one side and, and like, so he's purposely misleading them there, there could be some actual legal moral, but go ahead. I get, right. I agree with you though. But like, but on that extent, but to me, I don't mind being the one that states what like the act, the reality, like that's to me that to me, I believe that I'm doing the service of showing the reality, the the whole point of this podcast and showing losses and showing roto tracker screens and like, no winning is not all, you know, Oh, screenshots and no one ever loses. And 
that type of stuff. It's like, but it, it's not all losing also. I mean, like, there are profitable players that you never hear about or whatever that, and no one shares that type of stuff. So all that we see, all that a noob sees is a, a screenshot of $100,000 with PMR 36. And you're like, yeah, yeah, the, the slate is half over. Like, fuck you. Yeah. Wait, but I'm not doing it because it's like, oh, this guy's a fraud. It's just that, like, I, I'm more of, like, consumer protection of, like, I'm not calling people out or anything. Just the fact of, like, like this is the reality of it. And when people, because I'll get emails that are like, uh, like, I, uh, that, that so, someone has been playing for four months and they have a set, uh, like a 74% ROI in, in GPPs. And they're like, should I, should I take out a loan type of quite like, like dude, 74% ROI. Like that's not like, dude, you have a six month sample size and you have one big result. Like statistically that doesn't make any sense, but they, all they see is screenshot, screenshot, screen. Awesome. he wins all the time. I go, no dude, Alex loses like 92% of fucking slates. Like it's just, Yeah. He plays a lot of slate. Like, unfortunately, it, he didn't lose last night. No, he, he didn't. First, You're right. Second. <laughs> right. But but you understand the point. Like, if 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 all a new person or a less experienced person sees yeah. is the the highlights, the Instagramification of everything, not who's not many people show the reality. So I focus on the real. I I'd rather yeah. say that hey, the people that show the screenshots let. Until you show me your rotor tracker, I don't give a fuck about the screenshots. I, th- I think we could definitely agree on this too, right? Uh, we uh, we agree on all this, anyways. But like, I think most people could agree if you're not charging money, like then then, then then who gives a shit? Right. So it's like if someone wants to put a video out there and it's the complete opposite of theory theory of DFS or complete opposite of my videos, but it's free. It's like whatever. If you think he's accurate and logical, have at it. Okay. Once you're char- how about ads? putting ads on your stuff is that does that change things i don't think so i don't really think that changes anything okay now you're charging for your product okay i don't know i i i don't think i i still i still don't know brian you're not getting it i don't think there's anything wrong with that feel free to charge a thousand dollars for something that doesn't work that's perfectly fine but understand that what i'm do i'm the only reason i care about it is because not care to call people out, but care to make aware of what reality is, mm-hmm. is to help, is to help, pe- is to, is to, oh. is to help okay, people. Okay, I didn't, yeah, I definitely didn't. So you're talking right. about actually calling people out, not defending touts. No, no, I'm not defending. I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking about like when I remember this all stems from when I started playing three months in, I hit like $2,400 in soccer and I, that's all I was playing. Uh-huh. And I signed up for Roto Track. Like I, I mean, I came from poker. I wanted to do this seriously, uh-huh. and I had a small bankroll. But I have no one to compare it. Like I don't. Is it? Are my results good? Or is this? I mean, I have no fucking clue. And then I talk to another on Twitter. I another DFS soccer regular that was playing a year longer than me, and we shared our Roto Tracker screens. And it's like it's here's someone that I respect that I see doing well in the same contest that I'm starting to do well in. And I'm like, oh, 12% ROI? It's like, oh, then my 24% ROI is must be unsustainable because I don't even have enough sample size at that point. To n- I have nothing to compare it to. So right now, most of the time you go on Twitter and it, it, what do you have to compare to other than $100,000 screenshots? Or, you know, our subscribers win all the time, which, I mean, which is great. I have nothing against all of yeah. that. But no one has the when Alex shows his ROI, like he's shown his roto tracker, just like like the really broad sense, and you see like ROI like four point seven percent, and people don't believe it. They go, "He only has a four percent ROI." I was like, "Dude, he plays in the hardest contest, but he also plays such high Every- volume that four percent is a lot of fucking money." Yeah, right. But like yeah. they, but if people don't get that, like they look at their, their they they put it their their rotor tracker results in of three months sample size. And though maybe I should quit my job. And I'm like, dude, like, that's not a, like I have a 74% win rate in head to heads. It's like, yeah, you're playing one to $2 head to heads. Yeah. And you've played 
a grand total of 180 of them. Like that's that's nothing. But no, but show me show me a show me a tout site that posts those types of screens. Here's here's our 59% head to head win rate. Like you don't see that. So I feel like it's my if I if my goal is to teach people that I should be sh- I should be showing the reality yeah. and not just hyping up like this guy read my course and now he won a million dollars type right. of thing. So to me, it's not the anti other people. It's more of the why I do what I do type. Okay, of thing. you know it's funny. I don't even consider you a doubt, honestly. I don't. I don't. Ba- I barely consider myself a doubt either. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I I was talking more about just the clearly touting and market touting and everything in general. And I'm still okay with all that stuff. Like, right. Well, the buyer let the buyer beware. I, I let I, the buyer I agree beware. Like, right. it, like, like, who? What idiot? is going into the gambling online world and be like, maybe this, I should have a little skepticism. No, 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 no. <laughs> aping in. I'm aping into Vegas Dave here. Like, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't be, maybe you should You do worse things with that money anyways. And let, let Vegas Dave have it. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that's happening very frequently anyways. And I have no problem also – the antithesis, like Rufus Peabody and Captain Jack and Spanky and those guys, mm-hmm. although Spanky kind of went off the rails a little bit with accusations last week, but I'm fine with them saying, hey, Vegas Dave sucks and calling him out. And so that's fine, too. That's fine, too. Actually, I had like a long thread on this with uh, Squirrel Patrol got like people were mad at him because he posted on uh, uh, State Kings, like right. a high R, high R-I or something. And I wrote like, you know. Or whatever, like five tweet thread on it. It's like you you're welcome to criticize him and he's welcome to post it. And the customer is welcome to decide. And it's none of your goddamn business. Right. Whether he whether he, whether he's getting five percent off of them or they're getting or or they're getting five percent off of him. Like everyone here is working in their rational self interest. There is no charity going on here. Everyone's trying to make a little money or have fun or pay a you know, pay a premium to have entertainment equity, which is also fine. And I gamble on like the, the the tournament last week or whatever last month March Madness I don't know what I'm doing I don't know I don't watch those things I just want to bet on the games with my buddies and drink a few beers like I'm the I'm the fish I'm a willing fish in that situation so like like everyone just needs to chill chill out on that but don't you it's think that finger- at at some at some point there's a a breach of consistency or hypocrisy it's like like my my attitude. Would you would you agree with this? I don't do any sports betting content. Like I like for RG, like a lot of times, like when they have an expert survey, when I used to do it, like what's your best bet of the day? Like on an NBA slate, you know, like oh the Wizards plus whatever, you know, type of thing. On the morning grind, typically part of that question is like your best bet of the day, and I just make up some funny things. So like like right. how 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 you know the, what, what inning is Matt Harvey going to get pulled? You know, like. That type, a real a bet that doesn't exist because yeah. I know that betting isn't about the picks; it's about the value and the line. Right. So it's like, like if it always comes down to if I was the sharpest sports better, obviously by the time you get my pick, the line has moved, which means that I am not that what's what value am I presenting to you? None. Which means if I were to teach you how to bet on sports. Wouldn't it be antithetical for me to say, learn how to bet on sports and here are my picks? When when the teaching is, it's the same thing with the play whoever you want, which is facetious. Of If I'm going to say, uh, play as if the players, like you don't watch the sports and they're just names on a spreadsheet, how could I say that I like Patrick Corbin tonight? Like, it wouldn't be consistent. So for me to push back and go, well, I can't do any content that's really based around like my gut of what's going to happen because that's the antithesis of what I teach. So once, if you saw me do that, wouldn't my credibility of everything that I do just go out the window? Yeah. Your credibility would be gone back to your sports betting. I like that. You don't pick because like, you know, like I, I'm not, I have no edge here. So like, why would I say I want these guys plus eight? Cause I don't, I have no reason to believe I have an edge here, but like, Name any good sports betting content. I, I mean, I guess you might be biased, but like throughout the last 10, whatever, 10, 12 years of the internet being, you know, what it is, there's like no good sports betting content. No. Like, I, and, and that's there's the some tool. Why. There's some tools. There's some 
like not a lot, not a lot though. I'm being hyperbolic to, right. to a little bit, a little bit, but um, for the vast majority of those years, it's all garbage. There's some good forum posts and there's some good tools, blah, blah, blah. But for the most, because just what you just said, why would they give away their edge? It's way different than DFS where you could go like, here's the theory behind how to do this one thing. And here's how you solve this math, this math problem right. to arb these two markets that the sports book doesn't know you can mark that right. you can art or something like that. It's like, cause as soon as you do that and you get 2000 views on your YouTube channel, boom, it's done. That, right. That it's gone. Right. It's gone. And they all like, they follow us too. Like, they, like, like there are people from these sports books that like follow you, you know what I mean? And, uh, they, they, like, as soon as you post a video, all they have to do is click it too. So, like, of course, none of this information is going to get out there. Um, so you really have to dig for the sports betting stuff. But there are, there really are tools. There are calcul like you could. There's some arbitrage and hedging calculators. Like, to me, those are the things that are maybe more valuable. Setting up, you know, like some Excel templates, like for importing yeah. data. Like, I like to me, that's the type of stuff. But the actual, like, like the pit, like, like who do you think, who are you going to, like, even... For instance, like with the with the bat for for Derek Cardi, like if you yeah. believe that the bat is the best baseball system, or whatever, like all you have to do is just like well get a sportsbook account and all the accounts and put his uh, statistical projections in and see what lines are are positive or negative, and see where the where the lines are off, and then right. hopefully uh, m maybe you can make ten dollar bets, and hopefully you'll have your sportsbook accounts <laughs> like Stay, a year from right. now. But if you want to make beer money that way, like th that, to me, that that's that's the content, that's that type of content would yeah. be useful. But like, for me to like, it's the same thing of when when I do the RG stuff with the making the picks. It's like all I'm doing is reading the projections to you. Like I don't feel like I'm providing any value. Like I'm literally right. just reading the like you could do. Like why do I need to even talk yeah. for a half an hour? I'm just. What's the best play at pitcher today? The highest rejected pitcher. Like, just look at the projection. Never made any sense. 2v2. Uh, go to those two. two. <laughs> right. And delete your message. Right. Right. Why? But that's where the frustration, that's, that's where, that's where the frustration comes in. But I want to teach people how to think more than that. Sure. Yeah. But then I can't do the con, but the point is I can't imagine me putting out a fucking picks article. Be like, well, yeah. then all the stuff that you must have said beforehand for five years is bullshit. Yeah, the, the the pick stuff is like you guys are not beating closing line football sides five minutes before kickoff. <laughs> right. It's not fucking happening. I don't care who you are. You're not. You're not beating. You're, you're gonna things. find it offline five minutes before lock. A line. A line is gonna be off by sixty cents. Like, yeah. no, you're not gonna find that. You're not. It's not happening. You're. I mean, there are bet stamp, I think is this what it's called. There are companies coming around where you can, they track certain high profile people. They track their picks and you can also put your picks in there and have them verified, like verified by like you live in Illinois. These sports books are available to you in Illinois at this time. This is the line. Okay. Your picks verified. You can't put minus minus one forty, which you'll see this in the sports betting tout industry. Mm -hmm. Put minus one forty when it's actually minus one eighty, and you you didn't get it at that line, and you're just saying you did. Like so, like I think that's going to improve hopefully over time. And then you could just go to X site and be like, oh, this guy's a huge scammer. This guy's actually got like a four percent edge, and he's selling a package for twenty bucks. All right, maybe I'll hit his picks for this week. As long as you get the as long as you get the same lines. Yo, that's true. That's the big. I mean, problem that, but that's the to me that's sports. the big thing. Like it's it becomes it becomes like a a, a paradox. It, it it so right angle sports. That's their so they 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 are actually a winning tout site. So like they're like the only one. So the way they do it is they have a Slack channel, and I think it's in their Slack channel. It actually might be on their site. I've never paid for it, but I've, I was in their Slack channel for a little bit, and they say everyone come here at one fifteen. We're going to release the picks or the pick. Everyone comes in the room and they say, type in uh, Syracuse minus eight into your book. And we'll tell you in this countdown whether to click yes or no. This might be fake. And then they go, OK, that's not the real one. OK, we're going to type in. And then they do two seconds later. OK, type in uh, whatever Vanderbilt plus three. Like, OK, that's the real one. Then everyone just clicks enter, enter, enter. 
So that's how they try to get around just releasing the picks and the first hundred guys who get the email. Right. Ruin the line. And there are other things too. So like when right angle hits, releases one of their picks, a lot of times the line will go too far mm-hmm. and you could hit, hit the other way right back. Right, right. So you might want to be subscribed to them and hit them both ways and you can middle them. So they definitely provide, can provide value. But, they're, but, they're, but, <clears> but they're, they but, are one in a million. Yeah. But that comes, but that comes from the, 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 the right perspective. Like they're, 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 they're providing a service based around the philosophy that they're teach of, like that picks are bullshit and it's the value you get on the line. So yeah. if we say that Syracuse plus eight, it, there's an edge in it at one o'clock, don't yeah. bet it at plus seven, seven and a half, yeah. three hours from now. Like, so obviously you can't put up an article like that. It's yeah. like 10 minutes later, but everything else kind of defies that paradox of if subscribe to me, I'm a sharp better. Right. I'm going to give you a bet. It's Syracuse plus eight. And then five hours later you go and you get Syracuse plus eight. So it's like one, uh, if they were, if, if that line, number one, if that line moves, obviously you lost the value. So like, okay, now you're getting no value from me. But if the line didn't move and I'm so sharp, like why didn't the live move when I gave out my, like, like, like that's how sports books work. Like right. how sharp can I be if every pick that I give the line never moves? <laughs> yeah. Right? Right? You understand what I'm saying? Like no, then, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then how That's That's why I put a delay on cuz I would do I do uh NBA props. I probably cuz I do it not every day. Um and ML and um NFL props and I would put them on my site cuz it's like, yeah, I'm going to bet these and if you guys want to bet them, bet them too. Um and then by the time I would get to like my fourth site, like, you know, to, to like look at their lines, the lines moved, uh, 30 cents or something. And I'm like, I put this up an hour ago. Right. It's, I don't think I'm moving the lines, you know, like maybe it could just, uh, it could just be everyone else moved the line. And it took me an hour, but I'm like, I'm going to put a delay on here. <laughs> I'm going to put a delay. And, uh, uh, I, you want to sure get the number. Think, What's that? Because you want to get the number. Cause I want to get the number. Right. But, yeah. but that makes, but to me, you get to me, so if you provided me with that service, you would get more respect from me because it's like you're taking advantage of your own thing. You're not saying like if you don't mind getting this a half an hour after I get it and hopefully yeah, the line doesn't move. Right. At least you're That's coming true. from at least you're coming from how sports betting works rather right. than say that you have the winning picks and here you go. And right. And you right. got and you in, in the in the in the big thing about sports, betting, you got to price a lot of markets really quickly. Like a lot of them real quickly. And then you go, oh, okay, across all these sites, this one's worth, you know, whatever, two cents, five cents, or 20%, depending on how you're doing it with the EV. And then you go, oh, bam, 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 get them in as quick as you can. And then hopefully you don't get banned. That's really, it, 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 you don't, you don't even have to have picks. Like you don't even need them really. Right. You just Pick need to whoever do you want. Pick whoever, Pick whoever you want. You want. <laughs> if you're picking sides and totals in the major markets, you might go broke pretty quick. But other than that, pick whoever you want. Yeah. Pick whoever you want. Uh, for 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 an episode, this is the longest episode. Obviously, we have like an hour worth of 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 uh, political diatribes in the middle of if it. If you want to cut that out and release that, it's, it's no, we no people want to hear people want to hear Brick seventy five. They want to hear Brian. Okay, they listen to lols, whatever. They'll listen to this. Why? Okay, that's fine with me. I I think uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready for it, so we'll see how it goes. Right, but I remember beforehand. I I told you I would let you talk. You did, and I did let you talk. You did let me talk. Eventually, you actually it paused into... once where I'm like, "Wow, he didn't. He's not. He's actually waiting till I'm uh, like giving me an extra five seconds on one of those you were aware." And I was like, "No, go ahead, Jordan, please." No, see. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's fun. So I'm glad, you, glad you asked me. It was a fun conversation. Yes. YouTube channel, obviously, uh, Brick75 on... Yeah. I think it's, yeah, Brick75. I think it's actually Brian Hooper. Right. You could actually put a link in your Twitter profile. You know, you yeah, it's it. all you my can. Twitter profile, right. my site, and and Lulz is uh, 8 Eastern Wednesdays. Right. Which and came, I got a sports which came out of League of Legends <laughs> from a year ago. Right. A bit, those, a were bit. The, those were the fun shows. A <laughs> year you're over a year ago, bit we're still we're still milking that name. 
Yeah, th- those are crazy times. And I got a sports betting app coming out, hopefully, in the next beta, very top shot beta, top shot esque beta, very, uh, very raw. Hopefully, in the next week or something, if my developer can finish up this issue we have. And if you don't find him at those places, you'll see him uh, on top of you on the leaderboards at, on DraftKings <laughs> and FanDuel and Yahoo <laughs> and SuperDraft. Hopefully. Hopefully. And obviously, you could find the Theory of Daily Fantasy Sports, 15-hour audio DFS masterclass, how to think like a professional DFS player, at theoryofdfs.com.